Patterson and Michael Remus. Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Huss and Remo with you for uh, for a banger. We got Kenny Weeb on the road, who's going to be joining us a little earlier than normal today before he uh, jumps on a flight to uh, Carolina for tomorrow's 11.30 a.m. start. We'll also chop it up with Brandon Rewicki. Uh, we'll hear from Bones post game last night, as well as a few members of the Winnipeg Jets coming out of today's media availability. Um, we uh, will also get ready for the Briar, which starts tonight in Regina. Uh, we got to get our pal Ted Wyman on from the Winnipeg Sun to chop it up on that. And then, uh, of course, we'll look ahead to the games in Carolina and Buffalo this weekend for the Winnipeg Jets. Coming out of a disappointing night in Dallas as the Jets fell to 0 and 3 head to head on the season with the Dallas Stars, who are the first place team by points right now. Jets still have those games in hand, but um, we'll get to all of that coming up with Ken in just a minute. Um, you know, we'll probably talk about this a little later on um, when uh, when we get to it uh, after Ken, as I said. Uh, but I do want to quickly thank everyone that came out last night to our uh, event with uh, our great partners at Canadian Club for the Winnipeg Whiskey Festival. Uh, it was so great to see everyone. It was a bit of a different crowd than some of our other events and a lot of podcast listeners, people that we might not see each and every day hanging out with all of us on the YouTube chat. Uh, but what a great night we had. Um, and as I said, we'll talk about it a little bit more with Reem later on today. Uh, but uh, thanks to everyone that jumped on, and uh, we'll uh, look forward to doing that again. And a special thanks to John Waldman and the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame for uh, giving us an amazing place to uh, have that event and uh, and a great time last night. The only thing that could have made it better was a little bit of a better performance from the visitors in last night's game. Um, well, let me quickly thank our sponsors and uh, welcome back the gang at Consolidated Supply. Spring is just around the corner and uh, Spicy and the gang are getting real busy. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about them later on, but uh, Canadian Club, check out Winnipeg Whiskey Festival this weekend if uh, if you're able to. Manitoba Battery, Modern Man Barber Shop, the Winnipeg Jets, Cool Bet, Princess Auto, Wallace and Wallace, F Apparel, Sport Manitoba, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, Boston Pizza, Royal Sports, and, uh, oh, it's Friday. I'm already thinking about a little brown jug. Um, listen, as I say, di bit of a different schedule right now. Ken is not a diva. He's hard at work right now. He's got travel to make. He's got <laughs> skates to go to, and uh, let's get right into it. Remo's going to jump into the program in a little bit later on, but... Uh, Weber, great to have you on the program. You were looking good. We got video and everything. You look like, what are you, at the Dallas airport right now, getting ready to head to Carolina? Yeah, Huss, uh, great to be with you. Uh, happy Friday. Uh, thanks for being versatile and flexible. Uh, yes, just at the uh, Dallas Love Field Airport. The only direct flight today uh, on the old Southwest uh, bird was at 2.15, so... Uh, had to do a little uh, juggle action. Uh, just back from the Jets skate at the... Uh, practice facility here, uh, which is about a half an hour away, uh, close to uh, close to Cowboy Land, Huss. So out in Irving this morning, uh, for the folks who haven't seen, there were four absentee forwards. Uh, Gabriel Velarde, not a surprise. Uh, Sean Monahan, Nikolai Ehlers would imagine those two are, uh, are just regular maintenance. And Mason Appleton also skipped the skate today as well. And Rick Bonus did call all four of them game time decisions, but I would imagine that at least two and probably three of them play. And the biggest surprise was that he was hopeful about Velarde, whereas yesterday he seemed doubtful for Velarde. He didn't use the words, but he, he definitely by his tone, you thought he probably was unlikely. So I followed up by saying, does that mean Velarde woke up feeling better today, Huss? 
And then Rick said, not necessarily. So uh, I guess we're, we're in that, we're, we're, we're not quite in playoff mentality mode yet, but uh, I think he's trying to will it to existence that Velarde would play. I, if I had to guess, I would say Velarde doubtful and the other three likely. Hey, just quickly uh, on your travel, uh, you're on a Southwest flight. Is that where you just get a number and everyone lines up and you just pick a seat? Yes, the uh, the cattle call variety, but uh, I do I I've been using uh, your so number stuff that I, I I actually have a good number. Uh, that's also part of the problem in this case. The good number is I have a fourteen. Um, the bad news is it means I have to rush to get an exit row seat. Huh? <laughs> Otherwise, we could probably go a little bit longer and keep chopping it up. But in this case, it's a it's a sprint to the finish line. I'm going to try to grab a sandwich before or a little bit of barbecue. There's a barbecue spot. Dickie's just around the corner here. So I'm going to try to time it perfectly to uh, to get the barbecue, get into the line, hustle to my seat, and then transcribe like a maniac during the next uh, 2, 2.15 flight to arrive in, in Raleigh at about five, well, 4.45 Manitoba time. But uh, not a ton to report uh, out of the day's events. No line rushes, no... No hints. Uh, I asked Rick Bonus if he liked what he saw from some of the groupings that were put together in the uh, third where the industrial speed was going on the blender. The only hint he gave was that he liked Vladislav Nemesnikov up in that top line with Velarde out uh, due to the upper body injury. I know that uh, the beauty of uh, the old uh, Twitter machine slash X was that the speculation was running rampant that somehow Gabriel Velarde was benched uh, that obviously not being the case, but uh, Nemesnikov was one of the Jets who had a had a good game, um, and there and there and there weren't a lot of those us uh, in the yeah. game against the Dallas Stars last well, night. Well, I mean, listen, uh, I mean, we were, you know, obviously at the uh, the the Canadian Club event down at the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame, and we were just sort of finishing up the yeah. tasting and the program as the game went on. Boom! Before you know it, it was one nothing, and. Um, I mean, we can speak to that. I mean, puck management was something that Rick Bonus has been preaching to these guys, says it needs to improve. It did not look like it improved, uh, certainly enough in that first period. I mean, you were in the building. Uh, where did it go wrong for the Winnipeg Jets that put them uh, in that huge 3-0 hole going into the dressing room after 20? Yeah, it sounds wild to say after the first period where the Jets were down 3 nothing that they actually came out of the gate okay and generated some chances, although not necessarily, you know, not crazy high danger or from the, you know, from the dangerous area. But the Jets actually came out of the gate, had a really good redirection chance from Alex Iafalo. And the next thing you look up and there's Mason Marchment going in on a breakaway and Connor Hellebuck stood him up nicely. But for me, Huss, the game kind of tilted from there. Um, it, it was one of the areas that Rick Bonus addressed in his pregame interview at the after the morning skate with uh, with me and Mitchell Clinton. Um, he said they fly the zone a lot, and I didn't really recognize that or remember it from the first two meetings. Maybe it was that they were so long ago. Uh, but it, the fact that it happened right away, um, as I wrote in my story, Huss, it was like Rick Bonus had seen the future because all of the issues that he talked about at the morning skate that needed to be cleaned up. None of them were cleaned up in the first period, and basically Dallas imposed their will on the Jets, and the Jets played catch-up the rest of the night. Uh, pretty simple overall. Uh, on the first one, I mean, there's really no other way to put it. I mean, Cole Perfetti was looking for somebody who wasn't there. I mean, the, he wasn't really under enormous pressure on the forecheck by the Stars. Um, he had time to make the play, and, you know, sure, you could argue that Vladislav Nemestikov could have been a little bit lower, like closer to the hash marks, but the pass wasn't really in where it was intended. It did not hit the intended target, Huss. And yes, I mean, I mentioned this in my story, and I asked Rick Bonus about it 20 minutes ago. Like, the Jets' defense are taught to activate. So Neil Pionk was activating because he expected the pass to be made. So he's in between the blue line and the red line, expecting there to be an odd man rush. But that left Brendan Dillon to have to take care of the rest of the play and you know there's Jason Robertson uh, all alone and he found a, a, a spot through the five hole now on the second one I think there was a, a lot of talk about a bad line change um, and then but still a, a brilliant redirection by Joel Pavelski like that, that's just a, like an absolute top notch I wouldn't even say he wasn't covered Dylan DeMello was all over him 
But Pavelski found a way to get his stick on it on the backhand and had a perfect tip. And then he's on done the that a few one, times. Yeah, indeed, once <laughs> once or twice. I've I've written about it over the years once or twice. And then on the third one, it's just like literally like dog on a bone, Logan Stankoven. I mean, back pressure forces a turnover in the neutral zone, um, and he saucer passes it over to his line mate. And not only did he beat the Jets to the rebound, basically Wyatt Johnston thought he had an open net rebound goal, and Stankoven beat him to the puck because he was so tenacious. It, it's one of the wildest goals that you'll see. And at, in real time, I'm like, well, did Johnston get it? Did Stankoven get it? Because Stankoven wasn't like it, Johnston was in perfect position to score the rebound goal, and the next thing you know, that Stankoven leading the charge, and and on the replay you see clearly that he got to the rebound first, like just with the the, the a the great pursuit and the nose for the net, but just the tenaciousness to beat everyone to the puck, including his own teammate. I uh, thought it was just an exceptional play by Stankoven, and, and yeah, I mean the Jets got a lucky bounce on the power play goal. That, you know, you make your own luck sometimes. Vladislav Nemestikov, you know, the pass bounces off a stick and a skate and lands on a stick, and there you know, it's in the back of the net. Jets have some life, but they never really hust. They never really threatened. They were hanging around in that game, but I don't think they ever really threatened the Stars' lead in that situation. And and to me, Hus, this was another great example. Like, Jake Ottinger played very well, and he's been awesome against the Jets. Hasn't lost in regulation, and his numbers are sparkling. But Hus... This was another example of the value that Connor Hellebuck has provided to the Jets all Big year time. long. This is a blowout game, Huss. For me, I said 5-1 on the show last night. Could have been 5 or 6-1 without an empty netter if Hellebuck hadn't been sharp. And yes, I realize the Stars sat back after building the lead. But to me, the Jets, they didn't measure up in any category yesterday against the Stars. And hey, we know... Man, the Stars players were saying it themselves, us, including Matt Duchesne. You know, the first two meetings didn't mean anything until they did because the Stars played the exact same way, and so did the Jets. And that meant now the Jets are 0-3 against the team they may have to play in the first or second round. And now, they're I mean, again, this is not skies falling or anything else, but it's very simple. Rick Bonus told me last night, Huss, you can't win with your B game against the Dallas Stars. You better bring your A game. And the Jets have not brought their A game one single time in the you three meetings against the Stars. I would, I would actually say, I mean, I was going back, you know, through those games earlier on in the season. And, you know, I actually think the Jets played quite well. Like at five on five in those first two games, I mean, they were right there. Uh, it was the, the power, it was the special teams that really sure. were a huge difference in those games. Like, I liked last night's game less than I liked the way they played against Dallas earlier this year. I mean, I think you could make an argument that those earlier games could have gone either way. You can't make that argument last night, which brings me to my next question. We are one week away from the trade deadline. Yeah. What do you think Kevin Sheveldayoff was thinking at the end of that game, knowing that his team's 0-3 and knowing that if you want to get out of the Central Division at some point in all likelihood – you are going to need to beat the Dallas Stars in a best of seven series. Well, first of all, Huss, I mean, Kevin Cheveldayoff doesn't uh, view it through the same lens that uh, you or I or, you know, other reporters or people who are just fans, whether they're hardcore fans, casual fans or anything. His job is to look at the overall picture. And yes, our job is to drill into saying, hey, you know, potentially some issues got exposed against the Stars or have during the course of the year. I don't think that it, you know, you don't, if you're Kevin Sheffield, you don't panic because of one game or three, but you do definitely notice that now the potential, now you got to look at your priority scale. Are you prioritizing a defenseman? Is it a depth defenseman? Is it a top four defenseman? Or are you now looking to see if maybe potentially they need to have a middle six forward? Now, I, I wouldn't say top six because obviously we know. I mean, sorry, top six, middle six, whatever. Um, you know you have an internal candidate if you have to bump some, you know, because of Gabe Velarde's injury, we don't know the severity, so it complicates things to some degree. But you'd like to have some backing when it comes to the scoring. We know Nino Rinderreiter can jump up. We know Vladislav Nemestikov can jump up. But as for me, if the Jets want to win four rounds, and one of those rounds probably goes through Dallas and or Colorado before they even would have a chance to get through Vegas or Edmonton, or Vancouver, or some wild, wild card run, 
I think they need to add a little bit of scoring, especially because of the, you know, this drought for Cole Perfetti now is, is extended um, a, a really long time. And again, I'm not here to pick on Perfetti. This is a guy who I've been defending him for the last two months. You, you can look at Cole Perfetti's numbers, Huss. If I had told you he's going to score 15 goals this year, most people probably would have taken it. Even if he doesn't score again, he's almost at 15 goals, right? So, But the problem is, because of his great start, the expectation was going to be that Cole Perfetti was a 20-plus goal scorer, even though he's a pass-first player. So right now he's in a funk. That was That was obvious on the turnover, because Cole Perfetti is a smart player. It just... It was either the read wasn't there or it took a crazy bounce that he wasn't expecting. But that's a play that Cole Perfetti wasn't making earlier in the year, even though you expect young players to make mistakes. So the bigger issue is that he's not moving as well. We've talked about this now for about a month. Now, we know he's lost development time. We know that he's not you know, a, a gifted skater in a Kyle Connor or Nikolai Ehlers regard, but he's still smart enough to be an effective player. He's not going to turn into a bang and crash kind of guy on the fourth line, but he can still be an effective player because of his smarts and his skill set. He can shoot, he can pass, he can get to the right places, all of those things. But right now, nothing is coming easy for Cole Perfetti Huss. And to me, that's why I think they may have to dip into the potential of adding a, a forward unless they want to move up, whether it's Ayafalo who's pl- you know, playing well in that second line role or Nemesnikov. Like the Jets have enough pieces to get by but i think if you want to knock out four different teams you're gonna have to upgrade at that position now whether it's an anthony mantha or whether it's a guy with size six foot five 234 can score he's mean i'm I'm not sure if they're going to do that but i would think they would be looking into doing it um you know we've been talking about bishnevich for a long time the extra year would be beneficial in a lot of regards but it could also be detrimental because we're not sure if the Jets can afford it or the cost, the cost of that is significant. I mean, Andy Strickland was on and said, you know, he was looking yeah. at, you know, I don't mean, listen, you always kind of ask high, but he was mentioning two first round picks. The Jets don't even have one this year. So I do wonder right. how, I mean, maybe that second rounder from Montreal and next year's first, like how aggressive do you think Shevel Dayoff will be? Well, you'd have to probably look at a, a player who was a first, first, first yes. rounder. I mean, it's, you know, whether it's a Brad Lambert or Billy Hanel or whatever. Right. So, how aggressive, I mean, that. It, it, this is very simple to me, Huss. Kevin Chevaldeoff isn't going to be out there saying we're going to be as aggressive as possible. That That's not his MO. That's not his style. But, Huss, if you and I can identify that the Jets have two of their best players, two of their core players, moving from a salary just over $6 million to $8.5 million, I would say that your best chance to activate and be aggressive and push most of the chips to the middle of the table would be at the time when those players are making six and change rather than eight and a half million dollars. Right. I mean, it's just the way that it is. Um, You know, we know Rutger McGordy kind of complicates matters because he could come in and, and help the jets, whether that's on a fourth line role or somewhere else, but that's not a guarantee for the jets, but because of how wide open it is, but still recognizing that the teams that, the Jets and others would have to beat to go on a four round run are still a very high quality. I think they have to have a couple upgrades. Like this is a very good roster Huss. I think that in order to win the Stanley cup or compete for it, I think they need to upgrade in a couple of areas. Um, and those mentioned- being scoring size and depth on the back end. You mentioned maybe Rutger- even a top four guy. And, and I'll say it was an interesting conversation between you and Ren last night on KNR. And Rennie was pulling out the fire hose and every bucket around to pour water on the potential of McGrody being a real impact guy. I sucked. I, I took the uh, the shop vac out and sucked all of that water back out because, as you know, I think that Rucker McGrody has the opportunity to come in and to play. And I know. I guess you were talking about is he going to be a top six player right out the gate? I, I don't think anyone's saying that, but. Like, man, we saw what Stan Coven was doing last night. And you get that, you get a boost of energy. And there's nobody that has more energy than Rucker McGrory in his game. That enthusiasm, that excitement from getting to the National Hockey League. 
I really do believe that he is a guy that, you know, could be in the mix, you know, before the end of the season um, and then go from there. But, I mean, it was hard not to think about the potential of a guy like that when you see what Stankoven's done four games into his National Hockey League career. I know they're very different players, but for me, the Winnipeg Jets, there's a couple things that they'd like to do maybe on the periphery of their lineup. But if you could get a boost like that internally of someone that comes in to start their career that has done it at every level, we know the package that he brings, I do not rule out at all. And I'm certainly hopeful that they sign Rucker McGordy. He gets in and gets some games and then let the chips fall where they may by the end of the season as to who's in the lineup uh, on Rick Bonus's lineup card for game one of the playoffs. For sure, Russ. I just want to make it clear that the discussion isn't whether McGrady could come into the lineup for the Jets. It's Some po- folks are thinking that he could jump in immediately on the second line and just say, oh, you know, Cole Perfetti, thanks for your efforts during the year. We're going to put in the guy who's six foot two and has a bigger body type and bring some more energy. Yeah, like just, Perfetti is a great example. They're completely different players, but yeah, it's not Cole was a, or. You know, a very solid and contributing play, player for a long time. And he's hit a he's hit the wall here. He's hit a rut. So I just don't think it's 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 wise to. And you're not saying this, Hassa. I expect Rutger McGrady could come in and make an impact, but I don't think you can guarantee. I don't think you can count on Rutger McGrady being that middle six forward that can you know withstand the rigors of the playoffs and be a yeah, no, no, that, you know and that's not whether it's I'm a saying. double digit goal scorer, right? I mean, yeah. I think that Rutger's gonna you know if Michigan gets knocked out early. I mean. They're a top 15 team. They're not a top five team. Mm-hmm. Last year, Michigan thought they were winning the the whole the whole thing, right? Frozen four. And they could get to the frozen four because of the skilled players they have, but they're not right now one of the premier teams in the NCAA. So if that means Rutger McGordy can arrive on the scene a bit earlier, well, then of course he could maybe make an impact. But I I don't think it would be let's just put it this there. You ask me how aggressive the Jets were going to be. You know, they have a player in Vili Hainala that could potentially help the Jets. But I don't think we're looking at the Jets next Friday saying our internal candidates, Vili Hainala and Rutger McGrady, are the ads I have chosen to make if I'm Kevin Dayoff. Now, if the price tags are ridiculous on a deal, yes, that will be part of what he says. But I'm not expecting that to be the only ads the Jets make, and I don't think you are either. No, no, definitely not. I mean, and I know some people go, hey, everyone always overrates prospects and players. I mean, I I think I've been pretty steadfast in this for a long time. I mean, uh, there's a lot of players that, you know, go. uh, I guess I'll just say this. Of the prospects that the Jets have had with their makeup, the, the skill, the size, the speed, the experience of what they've done at every level. And we've seen this happen before. I mean, like, I know the Jets are technically, you know, historically long play with a lot of their prospects, but not always. I mean, Andrew Kopp came in, Jacob Truba came in, and I, I, I see Rucker McGrory following following that path. But to your point, and you're exactly right, that is not going to be the, the answer, this low answer. It might be a very nice bonus for the Winnipeg Jets, but I think when it comes to yeah. next week, we're going to see Kevin Chevalier probably – look at options both in the forward group and the defense core. Um, what I think is intriguing is how, when we get back to quote-unquote being aggressive, how much they are willing to give up. But I do agree with you. I mean, you read the tea leaves. You look at the way this team is constructed. You look at what's happening with the cap next year with those two players on the extensions going up. And where the team is in the standings right now, if not now, when? And I think that's something that we hear a lot from fans right now who uh, – Sort of expect the Jets to really take a swing at this. Um, And obviously that would include uh, some action uh, leading into or on the 8th of March. Yeah, no doubt. And and I think, too, we we recognize now the preemptive strikes have basically happened. So now it's a game of chicken. Who's going to drop the price? Who's going to increase their offer? That's where things are at. And and just quickly, us, we've mentioned Matthew Nyes as a comparable not in terms of style, but in terms of being a dominant NCAA player that came on for the playoffs. For example, Matthew Nyes, last year, Huss, seven games in the playoffs with the Leafs, one goal, four points, and he made an impact. Like, that's a solid impact. So for folks who just think Rutgers going to roll in 
and be a 10 goal scorer in the playoffs. I'm not saying he can't, but I'm saying that would be the exception rather than the norm. Now, do I think he can come in and provide some energy? Absolutely. But I don't think they're just going to be relying on that. So just to kind of put a bow on that Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, activity. Just on the other side, there's a lot of people that are completely out. There's no way he is a player oh, this no, no, year or anything like that. Like that. It's, it's, no, no. It's like not the one truth or the is other. Somewhere in, it is, the truth is definitely um, somewhere in between. And Hus, you had Craig Button on. Craig Button has watched Rutger McGordy live a lot more than you or I have. He's very high on the player, but same thing. Like he thinks he can make an impact, but I haven't heard Craig say that. Yes, the Jets should pencil him in on the top six. And I know neither you or I are saying no, that. No, no, But some no, people are very not. much saying that. So, but I'm also not dismissing him either. I, I love everything this guy brings to the table. He brings a lot of the qualities that the Jets don't have an abundance of, and that they could use in the playoffs. It's just a matter of when the arrival comes and how big the impact. So, yeah, I still think that there. And here's the other thing, Hus. The sellers are becoming a little bit more apparent, but Jim Neal talked about it yesterday. One of the big issues with why there haven't been more preemptive strikes, there's a bunch of teams on the bubble that think they can still make it, which is why there could be a flood of players available between Wednesday and Friday. But if an owner says, I want to make the, you know, we, we talk about Philadelphia all the time, Hus. Philadelphia is an anomaly. They thought they were rebuilding and they've been in a playoff spot pretty much all year. So are, are you going to punt on the season suddenly because you think it's the right thing to do? Or are you going to take the two playoff dates or the three playoff dates I know what or, or whatever? Is to that. Well, no, no, I, I, and I understand what they're saying publicly, but what are the pressures internally, right? I mean, yeah, I think they do still sell, but man, like it's a bit of a... You, They're in a really asking, good spot asking, right now. This is what I mean. And, and the team that was most likely to catch them, the Devils, keep stubbing their toe every other night, it feels like. So the teams we expected to catch the Devil or uh, to catch the Flyers, they haven't done their they haven't done their job. And I get it. There's still a, over a quarter of a season left. But man, all, I understand the believing in the vision and the plan and all of those things, but it doesn't always go as smoothly as it did. Like the Rangers are such a great example, Hus. They sent the letter. We're rebuilding. Now they're one of the best teams in the NHL. But that's also very abnormal, right? Buffalo's 13 years without a playoff. The Jets have been in the league for 12 seasons, Hus. The Buffalo Sabres have not had one single playoff date in that time. That's hard on a franchise, right? And we see it with the attendance in Buffalo. Well, so... And, and you know what? I know you're going to have to run, but uh, speaking of Buffalo, um, you know, when I saw this, I you think back to the last few years, like later on in the season, heading out east hasn't been kind to the Jets, and Buffalo hasn't been either. Um, uh, you know, last night in the National Hockey League, the Sabres had a big overtime win. I mean, not so much for them, but a devastating loss of a point for Tampa, who needs every single one. And uh, the Canes got a win. Just, uh, I mean, we kind of rent down, you know, the Velarde situation and, you know, everything coming out of last night's game. But just give us a quick thought on uh, this weekend that uh, you will be reporting for the Free Press from the 11.30 a.m. game tomorrow for in Winnipeg time in Carolina and then right back at it the next day, Sunday at 6 against the Sabres. Yeah, and the, and the, and the Hurricanes play a relentless style of game huh so uh, if the jets i don't i didn't see the jets feeling sorry for themselves today by any stretch this was a flush it and move on situation for them but if you're not sharper with with the elements we've been discussing puck management and uh you know line change something as simple as a line change i mean those guys can take advantage of it like this is the site of the great benching of last season and like part of the great unraveling for the jets and again i'm not saying that history is repeating itself I am saying there are warning signs and caution flags up that you better be sharp when the game starts uh, because they're the kind of team that can take it to you, especially in their building. Um, so we know asterisk bonus today. It's, it's Hellebuck tomorrow, Lauren Brassois on Sunday against Buffalo. And yeah, I mean, Nate Schmidt said it, Hus, flat out. When you lose that way to a rival in a big showdown game, you can't just sit around and say, oh, oh woe is us. The Jets have to be ready because they still have the ability to make it a good road trip. It wasn't a good start to the road trip, and if you're not sharp, it could be an ugly road trip before you blink your eyes and wake up in Winnipeg on Monday morning. Um, so anyways, I expect the Jets to be much better. I expect them to be sharp, uh, sharper, and see what happens. But, I mean, it's up to them now. 
when you've seen your standard slide, you identify the problem. Now you got to go out and do the correctables. A lot of the stuff is self-inflicted. That's true. But you can't have a, a litany of self-inflicted wounds that hang around for a month to six weeks and just say, you know, shrug your shoulders and say, no biggie. Because eventually the standard that you have isn't necessarily the standard. I mean, you, you want to keep that standard as Rick Bonus, but if you can't build the standard back up, then the standard moves. And if the standard moves, the Jets can't be as an effective team as they have been all year. So, again, I'm not sounding the alarm. They have done a lot of good things to this point, but they need to be playing their best hockey during the last 20 games of the year. But you can't just say whatever works for the next stretch of time. They still lead the division in points percentage, but you got to win those games in hand if you want to avoid the first round matchup with either Dallas or Colorado. So I expect the Jets to be sharper. Uh, This is a good test and, you know, it's up to them to show it right now. Basically, is is how I feel about where they're at. I, I don't I don't think this is the beginning of the end for them, but they definitely have some areas they have to clean up, and they've identified the areas. Now they just have to take care of the cleaning up part. Clean up on aisle six, right? Like that's that's where things are at right now for the Jets. There's definitely some cleaning up that needs to do with the game that uh, you know we saw really is the foundation of the Winnipeg Jets for the better part of right. the season. Despite the fact that you know you look at this last stretch and they've still won seven of nine games. Although a lot of people have talked about the way they've sort of feasted on teams below the playoff line. Hey, those all count too. But that is that speaks to the litmus test of last night, seeing if they were better. Could they handle the Dallas Stars? They didn't. And I would suggest that tomorrow, even though it's an Eastern Conference team, you want a great test to show if you're ready to play with the big boys? The Carolina Hurricanes is a, uh, a great time yeah. to show that you're uh, ready to step your game up. Yeah, bang on, uh, you know, and, you know, we know goaltending has been an issue for them, but Kachetkov just got uh, named Rookie of the Month. So uh, I would, you know, I haven't seen any of the t- tweets coming out, but I'd imagine the Jets will see him on Saturday afternoon. Uh, we know that uh, Rod Brindamore's teams play incredibly hard against the Jets, and they will again. Like, they're fighting for things as well, and they're also looking for their own litmus test down the stretch here. So for me, it's a big, you know, it's a big kind of bounce back uh, potential effort for them. And, um, you know, the, the, the Buffalo Sabres are in a weird spot for sure. But as you mentioned, they played the Jets hard. They kind of have been able to lull the Jets into some run and gun games over the over the stretches, especially at the home games that Buffalo's had. They got some high octane players, even though they've had a weird year. Um, so, yeah, they, they're going to have to be sharp. And then Huss, the other part too. I mean, yes, they're below the playoff line, but the Seattle Kraken, they're very much in the mix for that eighth spot, and the Jets play them twice in three days. So if you're not ready to play the Kraken, look at what Grubauer did earlier this week. If you're not ready against them, all of a sudden that team has life, and then the Jets could potentially be reeling going into Vancouver, and Vancouver's not happy with how they're playing us. So there's a lot of teams kind of in in show-me mode right now, and the Jets need to get that urgency level back in their game. You can trust in the foundation. But you need to elevate when 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 the games get tougher, and that's the test for the Jets right now. Well, I actually watched that Penguins cracking game uh, late night right. after we finished up yesterday, and yeah, Grubauer was a wall. Pittsburgh couldn't score. Um, the Kraken are no joke, and they are right in the mix. And we all remember what they did last year in the playoffs when no one could believe they made it. So, uh, well, first things first, Carolina and Buffalo this weekend, and then we'll have you back in town to uh, chop it up before back-to-back games against the Kraken um, at home on Tuesday and then on trade deadline day in Seattle next Friday. Uh, I see you side-eyeing that barbecue. Go grab yourself a sandwich and uh, get ready for the cattle call of uh, Southwest Air. Thanks for doing this, Weaver. My pleasure. Thanks for squeezing me in and uh, have a tremendous weekend, my man. Glad the Great event went Mike, well yesterday. by the way. Great Mike. I mean, you sound absolutely, um, th- this has been some of the best, best sound quality we've had on uh, uh, at any point. Same mic. I just, uh, I'd left it off the stand and uh, got it a little closer to the big mouth right now. So, you know what? It's whatever, whatever it is. Doing it's, our, just it's doing, doing our best. <laughs> Thanks for your time, pal. <laughs> Right Have an on. awesome weekend, my man. Cheers. There is, uh, there is Kenny Weeb. Uh, we're going to hit the Jet dressing room a little bit more coming out of last night's game as well as uh, what we got from the Jets today after that skate that Ken just broke it down. And again, Ken, on the road with the Winnipeg Free Press. Check out the Freep for all of Ken's reporting on the road 
with the Winnipeg Jets. I mentioned March is here. Can you believe it, gang? It's actually pretty nice outside. We'll see what we get tomorrow. Some pretty gnarly weather, I think, coming to southern Manitoba. But for the time being, March is here, and uh, spring is just around the corner. And it is great to have our friends at Consolidated Supply back on board, ready for another great year as the leaders in irrigation system, artificial turf, golf carts, as the exclusive club car dealer in Manitoba, and other great options for your property, including hot tubs and amazing outdoor kitchens. And of course, they're also the leaders in small engine parts and repair. As you look ahead and get ready for your projects in spring, particularly if you're talking turf, irrigation, or anything to do with the golf course, Consolidated Supply has you covered. Pop by and see them. they got that beautiful showroom that opened last year. It is open to the public. They're at 1395 Niaqua Road East. And again, to find out more on everything Consolidated Supply can do for you, your home, or your business, check them out online at cte.ca. Uh, big cheers to our friends again at Canadian Club. Thanks so much to everyone that came out yesterday. Um, make sure to uh, check out the Winnipeg Whiskey Festival this weekend if you can still grab a ticket and not uh, all the amazing Canadian club offerings that are not only at the Whiskey Festival but at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. And a special thanks to our, our guy James Hart who was uh, very integral in setting up last night's event that uh, went over so well with our listeners that came out. And thanks again to everyone that joined us. Uh, enjoy responsibly this weekend and look for Canadian Club all of their favorites at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. And, uh, hey, you know, now spring is, well, I'm not sure. We can't really say it's officially here, but March is at least here. And I know for Donnie and the gang at Manitoba Battery, they are fired up because the brand-new location is open. A big, beautiful new spot at 482 Dover Court in the south end of the city. Uh, we already know that their pricing is second to none. They've got an incredible staff They'll deliver any purchase to you citywide for any purchase over 60 bucks. But right now, we want to see people come down and check out the new store. Um, and they've got even better deals right now because any battery that's regularly priced at over 60 bucks is $10 cheaper when you pick it up in store. And uh, I laugh. I know Kabilis is uh, hitting the sticks, and there's some gamers out there as well. If you've got any needs for AA and AAA batteries, you can skip the cheap versions and grab some industrial grade energizers for only 40 cents a piece. Uh, they've also got a great deal on uh, massive sets of booster cabers, 25 feet long, one aught gauge, heavy clamps for only 49.50. Um, there you got it, folks. It's all there at the new location, 452 Dover Court Drive. Check them out. And of course, the original is at 1026 Logan Avenue. And for all your battery needs, start off by going to manitobabattery.com. And uh, this is before we bring in Michael Remus. Guys, if you need to get a cut this weekend or uh, got a big event coming up where you want to look good, Pop by and see our friends at Modern Man Barber Shops. Eight locations in Winnipeg now, including the two newest locations on Plessy Road and on Pemina, just over by Bishop. Modern Man's got you covered with great haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. You can book your look and make an appointment via modernmanbarber.com and give them a follow on Instagram at Modern Man Barber Shops. All right, we're going to get to the jet room in a minute. Brand new wiki's coming on in about 20 minutes, but let's get Remus in here. A little bit of reversal. Usually we sort of chop it up right off the mm -hmm. bat and then have Ken later on, but he's got to get a barbecue sandwich. He's got to get the cattle call into Southwest, and uh, he's doing his thing, so it was great to have Ken on. Uh, what's going on? Great time last night, huh? It's good Ken. to see you. First of all, Ken, such a diva. So many text messages. Although I'll give him credit. Like, he was texting me at, like, midnight, like, his schedule. So appreciate him hey. being able to fit it. That was, that was the only window. And I do need to chime in. Industrial. I've never heard of industrial strength energizer at Manitoba Battery. But I'm pulling them up here. Yeah, that's a real thing. I'm going to have to look into that. Might have to put them in my Xbox controller. I got a lot of kids' toys. Us, I thought I was done with batteries, but all my kids, yeah, Donnie, there you go. right here, this sucker. We're you got industrials? Need, we're going to need, well, I haven't yet, but I'm going to. I'm going. I'm getting some industrial. I didn't what even, were my original ones? I've never even heard of those. I've got some. I don't know how I got these. Maybe these came with, with the controller. They're Duracell, but it says not for yeah. retail sale. 
So maybe these were the ones that came oh, up. Anyways, you... yes, I'm going to go over and uh, I'll, I'll get a nice big pack of industrial grade energizers from Manitoba Battery, and uh, this thing will be good for for Man. many many games to come. Industrial. I didn't even know that existed. I don't think that's for like consumers. I think this is for only only like serious batteries. So. <laughs> That hey, um, superpower controller. Quickly, by the way, shout out to T. Konopoli. Uh, I know you uh, you popped this in while we were talking to Ken. Uh, appreciate the super chat, boss. If Jets are serious in for Cup, they need to make a bigger splash. It may involve moving a Villy or Fett's IMO. Sorry, Phyllis and others. NHL is a ruthless business. Um, uh, listen, I know the deadline is going to occupy most of the conversations next week. Um, but, uh, as of right now, I, listen, I can't imagine the Winnipeg Jets are considering anything with Cole Perfetti. I, I think that they just need to get the young man some confidence back. They've moved him down in the lineup. Alex, I follows up there on the second line. And now with Gabriel Velarde out, who knows? I mean, maybe Fetz gets uh, an opportunity to move up and uh, can really jump at it right now, but there's a lot going on, but I think Ken laid it out quite well. Um, you know, he's already been very, very productive this season. If you dig a little deeper into what he's done this year, he's made big, big strides. He's had a really, really rough month. That happens to all sorts of players, especially younger players right now. And, um, you know, I, I think Perfetti's going to be a, a big part of this moving forward. Uh, the big question is, can he get it going and, uh, you know, just get some positive momentum for him individually? Cause we know that will help the, uh, help the team. But, uh, but Rima, we saw that game, and I mean, unfortunately, Perfetti was front and center on that first goal with uh, a very uncharacteristic gaff by him uh, with that pass, as Ken described, kind of going behind the net, hitting it off the boards, and next thing you know, it's bang, bang in the back of the net off Jason Robertson. And I think that just sort of speaks to how it's been going for Cole lately. But uh, certainly for the Jets' best interest, that needs to turn around quickly. And, you know, with this injury to Gabriel Velarde, who knows? But I think that might mean it might take an injury or two for Perfetti to get a little bit more chance playing up in the lineup. We'll see whether that happens, but um, he's got to make something happen soon. It didn't happen last night. Yeah, I'm really shocked at uh, people turning on Cole Perfetti here on social media saying, send him to the moose. People think, like, short whoa, equal, whoa, whoa, whoa. E equal. I'm seeing a lot of that. I mean, people think short equals bad, tall equals good. And I don't agree with that at all. We saw Logan Stankoven come in. He's listed yeah, at 5'8". Five, 5'8 eight. Five, eight of him. 5'8". He's got four points in four games. Perfetti was very, very good. He was fourth on the team in, in points at one point of the season. Guys go through slumps. It happens. He's a young guy. His development curve is, is very strong, and you know he's going to have a very good career. But it, unfortunately, it's a tough time for him and wasn't a great look there uh, on that first goal. But, hey, that's... That stuff happens, but I. But if you are the fourth line, has you got to protect the puck. You can't be on for goal for goals against. So I think he'll turn around and look. Maybe if you know Nino or Nemeskov could score one of the on the great setups he's given them over the last couple weeks, he'd have a couple assists. So for a guy who's who's a passer like him, he's kind of relying on other guys scoring too, and he's not the only one uh, going through it right now. So certainly tough, and you know we've kind of talked about the Jets not playing the way that they had played earlier on in the season. I'm not going to use the term second half slide, but they just haven't really found it lately. And they went up against a Dallas team that is very good, very deep and uh, has been kryptonite for the jets, especially at home. Uh, what is eight Oh and one now their last eight, the last nine meetings at American airlines arena. So they got to figure out a way to beat Dallas. And I actually agree with what you said to Ken, those two games, he, earlier in the season were much closer oh, yeah. than, than last night. And the special teams really was the difference. This one was very tilted in Dallas's favor. I, I remember leaving the building, uh, ripping down to the, uh, the to Princess Auto Stadium to see the Bombers mm -hmm. um, coming from that game, thinking that, I mean, the Jets, and again, this was very early in the season when we were learning about Winnipeg and they'd had some nice wins. We thought that was going to be a big test. And, I mean, they were right there with Dallas. And again, this was something we talked a lot about for the first three months of the season. Great five-on-five -five play, great numbers, analytics, goaltending. Um, special teams wasn't good enough. And that, to me, was my takeaway from those games earlier this season. You know, unfortunately, that wasn't the case last night. And, 
you know, and I'll, you know what, I'll, we'll put this to the chat right now. And I know a lot of people have been having takes as we've talked to Ken, but why not question of the day for not Autocorp, but Waverly and McGilvery? Um, what, what, what was your takeaway from la- that game last night? And I know I asked Ken, you know, what's Kevin Chevaldeoff thinking? Yes, he's not making a decision based on one particular game. But I do think, Reem, that, you know, in the picture of the trade deadline, the week beforehand, um, you know, deals and, and, and decisions are made in the present. And, you know, as good as the record's been since the losing streak, you know, winning now seven of nine, it's hard to ignore that, you know, there has been some slippage in a number of things that made the Jets the first place team that they've been for a good portion of this season. And uh, I, I'm very intrigued as to, you know, what that does to, um, you know, the, the the feeling of the general manager as far as the needs of his team and what needs to happen right now and how, as I mentioned, aggressive they're willing to be uh, to fill a couple of holes potentially, potentially at the expense of picks or players or guys that might fit in down the road in the future, but not necessarily right now in this season for the Winnipeg Jets with the opportunity they have at hand. Yeah, I think looking at the Jets, we've heard for a while they want a, a depth defense and maybe they don't trust Logan Stanley or someone who can step in. Uh, you know, Billy Hanel, I'm not expecting him to come in unless there's like a number of, of injuries. And we're seeing, you know, you know, Ken said this on KNR yesterday, when they go up against these top teams in these tight games, they have a little trouble scoring. And Cole Perfetti, you know, he was a great part of your secondary scoring before and you know, the Lowry Nina Ryder line have kind of quieted down since their hot start. I think you gotta look into bring in some kind of a scoring winger. I was looking at past trades of the Jets made at the deadline, but Lee Stepniak came in, you got him for free. Uh, this was a while back, it was twenty fifteen, almost ten years ago. But is there a guy out there, you know, what is it gonna take to get an an Anthony Mantha or someone who can come in and give you uh, a little boost? So I you know, I do think you need to you know, get some help on defense and a little scoring winger. But what are they prepared to get up, give up? I don't think it's going to be enough to get, like, Butchnevich. He's not coming here based on what we heard. Jake Gensel, uh, you know, Edmonton has their eye on him, I think. They still got their first-round pick. Edmonton, listen, I talk to Dusty every day in the lock shop. People <laughs> in Edmonton think that they're getting Gensel and Butchnevich. I mean, they have, like, 20 bucks of cap space. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're in a... <laughs> Like, it's it, it is funny, but those those are two very intriguing players. And again, I get it. The GMs are saying this is what it's going to take for these guys, and that's what you hear floated out. That doesn't necessarily mean that's what they're going to go for. But especially in Butchnevich's case, they're under no need to trade him. I mean, they've got him under contract for next year. He's been a huge part of the club right now, and. I mean, Armstrong's only making that deal if it makes a lot of sense for the Blues in the big picture. Uh, I don't think they're looking to get rid of him. The big question, I guess, is whether uh, a rival GM is going to be able to make the move and uh, to, to get him to pull the trigger. Um, let's hear. Uh, let, let's just kind of wrap up last night before we get to Bones from today. Um, and you know, Bones was not happy, uh, as you would as you would imagine, uh, after that game last night. A really rough third pe- uh, first period. And, I mean, I guess you could say there was some pushback, but as Ken mentioned, I mean, the Stars were in control of that game, frankly, quite comfortably after the 3 nothing lead. Um, here's what Bones had to say about last night's loss in Dallas. That's what we've been talking about this for two weeks. So uh, I, I, there were some good things of the first period, but then you just beat your, so You give them three goals like we did having the puck twice and then turning it over and then a terrible line change. That's just beating yourself and that's just giving a very good hockey team three goals. It, 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 it wasn't as bad as the score, but we just, it was self-inflicted problems. Sure. Uh, what's made it tough against Dallas this year? Now 0-3 against a team yeah. when you've been great against everybody else in yeah. the division. We just haven't played as we haven't, we haven't brought our A game against them. And you know, there's, there's just not enough guys uh, tonight and the games that have, have brought their A game. It's just uh, a B game is not going to beat them. And uh, they've played better than we have. Yeah, and uh, that was the B game <laughs> of uh, Bonus's squad last night. Um, there was, and Ken referred to this, I mean, a lot of talk about Gabriel Velarde being benched for the third period. 
Um, I guess that might be better than having him being hurt, but uh, it clearly was not a benching as uh, Bones updated Velarde and his state after the game. Well, Gabe is hurting, so first of all, Gabe's not bench. Gabe is just dealing with an upper body injury, so we just had to, we had to cut back because he was struggling out there. You could tell from that, so uh, we had to make an adjustment with that. Um, you know, Vladdy was fine. You can put Vladdy anywhere, and he's smart and fast enough to keep up with those guys. Give some concern that Gabe might be not be available on Saturday. Yeah, was, I'd be concerned about that. Uh, so concerned. We'll hear from uh, Bones from today in a minute. Um, uh, here's just one more from uh, the head coach. Uh, talked about the second power play last night and a few other notes coming out of the team's loss to the Stars. So, well, that's huge. And uh, they made some good plays. And uh, we want two units going. So that one, if the one unit's off, then that second unit's going to come through for us. And they did tonight. What do you expect from Carolina? A hard game. A hard game. They just work. They pressure you all over the ice. And uh, we're going to have to play a whole lot better than we did tonight. Do you think the way that uh, Hellebuck is able to shut things down? Yeah, he was he great. He wasn't the issue at all. So it's unfortunate we couldn't we couldn't get a five on five goal uh, and capitalize and, and get us going. We thought after we won the second period we'd get going again, but we had a tough time getting out of our zone early. Then we took those penalties and it you know took away a lot of momentum. So there's Bones last night after the game. And you know, Reem, I, I had forgot about this until Ken mentioned it. But yes, this is the scene. Well, tomorrow, the Carolina is the scene of the uh, the benching last year. Mark Shifley and Kyle Connor. And um, I mean, those guys, to get out of this, those guys in particular uh, are really going to need to I think take that five on five game to uh, a, a much better place right now. They have been finishing. They've been eating on the power play and Kyle Connor has been scoring some goals, uh, but overall at five on five, they have not been where they've been maybe for the majority of earlier than season. And I'm sure those players in particular will remember what happened in Carolina last year going into tomorrow's matinee. Yeah. 11 30 start time. How is it going to affect the body clock? I mean, I know they're in Eastern time. It's 12.30 there, but it is the scene of, yes, last year's benching. And when I think of Carolina and the Jets, I think of Carolina scoring three goals with an empty net. But that game was here. Uh, this is their... Big and, save, Dave. And it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a tough one. Uh, it's going to be a tough one, Huss. So, uh, you know, we'll see how they bring it. And, yes, Ken did mention Kochetkov, the rookie of the month. So maybe they do have that goaltending figured out. Uh, Freddie Anderson. He just got cleared to return as well, so they have their eye geared toward the playoffs. I wonder what they're—you haven't heard their name in any rumors uh, either, actually. I do wonder uh, what what they'll do, but you they know it's going to be another been test. One of the more quiet teams at the deadline. I mean, they—you uh, know—the last few years they've been legit contenders and haven't yeah. really made any big, big swings. Um, but I'm sure we'll get some of that in uh, heading into tomorrow's game on a uh, variety of coverage before it. Let's just quickly get to DeMello. You know, it was funny. We were watching on that big screen at the Hall of Fame, and there was a few moments in the game, both on the ice and on the bench, where Dylan DeMello was extremely animated at times. Um, he spoke after and uh, talked about that frustrating first period for the Jets. So that was the most frustrating part of the first period for, for your group. Spot him a three goal lead. I just, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I don't know what it was. It just, you know, we felt internally here we gave him those three goals and you're down, you know, three nothing in the first to a really good hockey team. Three nothing down to anybody in this league is tough. So when you're down three nothing against these guys in their home building after you, we know that they've, you know, have won many games here in the last five, they're one, two, and two. We knew that it was going to be a tough task. I thought we did a good job of, um, you know, still working at it and getting looks, you know, big goal for our power play to get us going, but, you know, we can't be spotting teams three goal leads, especially in the first period. It was just some mental lapses, and um, they capitalized. You know, you could feel some real disappointment in uh, DeMello's uh, post-game comments, and a big part of it is I think every player knew they kind of owed Dallas one. They expected better from themselves, than they didn't get it. Uh, DeMello sort of expanded on the disappointment of uh, losing for a third time this year to the Stars. Uh, 
it's certainly disappointing. I think, you know, obviously we want to win every game. We want to compete hard every game. You know, and it wasn't necessarily a lack of compete. It was just some mental mistakes there and, um, you know, missed coverage, bad change, you know, turnover. And, you know, when you're playing a team like that, they're going to make you, they're going to make you pay against the top teams. So, um, yeah, it's disappointing. Obviously, this was a game we were hoping to, to get and it was an emotional game. And, um, again, there were still some pauses there for us, but, um, yeah, I think I think overall we'll definitely be disappointed with, with the start and the result. Safe to say you're happy to have one more crack in the next month or in, in April. Or? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, you know. I think we understand that we've lost three of them now. It's disappointing. It's frustrating. But uh, yeah, I mean that's a game definitely. Uh, I'd like to think our group will be ready for. All right, a little more from uh, Dylan DeMello post game speaking uh, after the uh, the loss to the Dallas Stars, and uh, Del- Mello kind of finished up with asking if that you know that game, the way things went. I mean, it had been going well for them on the scoreboard; they'd won seven of eight. But he was asked if that was a bit of a wake up call for his club last night. Is it one four in a row and seven of eight? But you felt like there were some parts of your game that needed to improve. I mean, it's kind of not a wake up call, but is it sometimes something to kind of snap a group to attention when we get close to the last twenty here in the stretch run? Yeah, we maybe you know got away with some some things in our game that was uncharacteristic. Um, you know, I don't want to say lesser opponents, but you know we, we just got away with some things maybe in the, in the previous games where tonight. You know, we're down three nothing in a heartbeat when we're not, uh, you know, not not making the right plays and not making the right reads, and um, it kind of bit us in the butt when uh, when we weren't doing those things. So, uh, yeah, a bit of a wake up call, but I think at the same time we understand what we did wrong, and um, this group's pretty good at rectifying it. So hopefully we can, uh, you know, short term memory here in, in regards to a big game on Saturday. All right, so there's Dylan DeMello uh, speaking after last night's game. Now a quick turnaround for the Jets. They practice today, and are now heading to Carolina. Um, Rick Bonus, as uh, Kent alluded to, uh, gave an update on Gabe Velarde's injury and a few other notes that the team got on the plane. Here's Bones from uh, just in the last hour or so in Dallas. Well, we're hoping that he's can play tomorrow. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, all the guys that missed practice today, they'll be game time decisions. Okay. Is that, I mean, yesterday you weren't sure about Gabriel. Is he just woke up feeling better? Or? No, not necessarily. So we'll see how he feels tomorrow. Uh, what's the process? We always hear about flushing the game. I mean, what's that 14-hour process like when you know that you have another game ahead of you? You know there's some disappointment, but how do you go through that as a coach, and, and how do you expect the players to deal well, with it? Well, you know, we talked about it after the game. We know we're better than we showed last night. So we're playing another great team tomorrow, and we just have to uh, we just have to raise our game to the level that we're accustomed to playing. So for the weekend, is it Hellebuck and Brassois, or what's your goalie plan? Yeah, that would be about right. The, the the dance going on between Bones and Ken. There, there is some comedy involved in there, and uh, well, Bones has done this for a long time. He's he's got some lines, uh, but Hellebuck tomorrow, and then LB, who um, was brilliant earlier this week in his last win, going up against the uh, Buffalo Sabers tomorrow. Though it's the Carolina Hurricanes. Bones talked a little bit about tomorrow's opponent for the early matinee game. Oh, these guys! These guys pressure the puck more than Dallas. They pressure you all over the ice, and their D are up, and the two forwards are coming hard. And in their zone, they're chasing you all over the place. They're big, they're fast, they're physical, and they pressure you all over the ice. If you saw Dallas last night, they started to back up a little bit, and clog up the neutral zone. You're not going to see that against Carolina. Rick, you mentioned line changes a few times in the last couple of weeks. Here, is it just kind of happening, or how do you how do you avoid bad line changes? When well, you yeah, yeah, shift length is important puck management is important um, just not getting those stuck out too long and then you, you're making the bad change and we got to watch those three quarter race changes because it cost us a second goal last night sure you know that is something that uh, i mean i know i've had conversations with friends watching the game that you know over the course of this past three weeks and i'm not sure maybe we're just noticing it more or it's seemingly creating more chances the other way but there has been some ugly line changes for the winnipeg jets and and bones cited one last night that directly led to one of those first period goals um just one more on carolina tomorrow's opponent um they are relentless as bones just mentioned they've also been incredibly consistent and uh, here's bones just talking about carolina's style of play and the way they're able to replicate that consistently over the course of an 82 game season 
They've built that team over the last four or five years. They have, and they, they want to play a big, aggressive, physical style. Well, then you got to go get those types of players. Right? If that's how you want to play, then you go find the players that do it. And uh, they've done a really good job there of filling all those holes with players like the, the way they want to play the game. When a team plays that kind of tenacious style, how do you counteract that by imposing your own style? against them yeah well you just have to move the puck fast you got to move it quick which means you got to get back and be available and then you've got to make sure again you're putting the puck in behind them when, when there's no other play to make you you get cute against them they're going to make you pay if you just if you take what they give you and play north uh, and carry it in when you can and dump it in when you have to then uh, you're making the game a little easier for yourself all right so there's bones from today team on the bird right now getting out to carolina early Early start tomorrow, 11.30 a.m. Don't see too many of those for the Winnipeg Jets. I know the IC guys will be getting going at 9 a.m. for a de facto pregame show. Uh, and then, of course, IC and our pals k &R firing it up afterwards on their respective channels for post-game coverage. Um, Brandon Wicke is going to jump in. We'll talk a little bit more about the Jets and get his take on uh, the Flyers and some of the other intriguing teams heading into next Friday's trade deadline. Had some great conversations with a number of you that came out last night to uh, the event at the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame with Canadian Club and the Winnipeg Whiskey Festival. And of course, a huge topic was the Jets off the ice. Um, you know, some great feedback from people, appreciated all the conversations, and it was great to hear uh, that a number of folks are uh, thinking about or in the process of getting together with friends and getting on board with season tickets. There's a picture of the uh, of the event of everyone. Shout out to uh, the the gang at uh, at CC man. It was a, it was a great crew, and uh, Mike and Tish did just an amazing job of taking us through all the whiskeys. Um, but pertaining to those questions that we talked about with ticketing and finding out more, the response has been very very positive so far. That I'm hearing, um, but they've got a lot of work to do, and this is going to go over the course of the next seven months. Uh, if you want more information on thinking about reserving and getting in on priority playoff tickets by putting a deposit in on a package for next season. The time to do that's now. Get over to winnipegjets.com slash deposit. All the information on the map, pricing for next season is there for you, as well as your opportunity to throw down and get in line with ticket package holders for priority playoff tickets for the upcoming Stanley Cup playoffs. I do want to thank Wallace and Wallace. Man, this is a perfect example of what we've been talking about you know, with the stress on the overhead garage doors over the course of the winter. Freezing cold one day, beautiful the next day, cold again the next day. This is the time that puts the most stress on your overhead garage door. In addition to be the fencing specialist and experts in town since 1946, Wallace and Wallace is the place that will take care of you and prevent downtime for your overhead garage door. You can give Wallace and Wallace a call to book your maintenance and service call today uh, for all your residential and commercial overhead door sales and service needs. There's only one name or two you need to know, and that is Wallace and Wallace. And I got to shout out our pals at uh, F Apparel. We mentioned March is here. Can you believe that? April just around the corner. Next thing you know, it'll be spring and it'll be wedding season. If uh, you realize that it's about time to up your menswear game or get ready for the change of the season, get on down to F Apparel now. Get fitted and get set up with uh, custom suits beginning at just 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible massive selection of menswear accessories. And speaking of spring and wedding season, if you are in a wedding party or getting married, make sure to talk to the guys at F about a 15% discount when the fellas get their suits at F Apparel. They're down at 190 Smith Street downtown. You can make an appointment at F. That's E phapparel.com. Uh, and just before we get Remo back in here, shout out to our friends at uh, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge as uh, we uh, see a little bit of snow melting, at least today. We might get a bunch more tomorrow, but think about the summer. We start thinking about putting the line in the water and there is no fishing experience like the Aikens experience at Aikens Lake. Uh, Manitoba's fly-in fishing lodge where you can be on the water in less than two hours from the city of Winnipeg and as great as the... Amazing fishing is the hospitality from the Turan family and the Aikens team is even better. I'm counting down the days to get out there again this summer. For more information on availability and booking for the 2024 season, hit them up at AikensLake.com or check them out on all their socials 
at Aikens Lake. All right, we're expecting Rowicki jumping in in a few minutes, but uh, Remo, you 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 threw that picture up last night. Um, you know, just because we brought Ken on so early, we didn't talk about it. What a uh, what a great event last night, and it was awesome to see and kind of remind us all the podcast listeners that we maybe don't see live on YouTube each and every day that are a huge part of the uh, WST community, if you will. And uh, it was very different than some of the things we've done at Little Brown Jug before or kind of getting together for games. But, man, it went off, and uh, what a show uh, the uh, our friends at Canadian Club put on for uh, everyone, as well as those incredible, those charcuterie boxes that the folks from DeLucas pre- prepared for everyone mm-hmm. absolutely blew my mind. Yeah, oh, here, let me throw it on screen real quick. Uh, first of all, great night. I never really done a whiskey tasting, but I learned a lot about uh, whiskey, that's for sure. And some great uh, drinks there. And, you know, great to meet some, meet a bunch of people who listen to the show. As you said, a lot of people on the podcast, as well as on, on YouTube. Uh, so I had, you know, the venue at the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame with all the memorabilia there. Very good. And we got to watch the Jets game on their projector screen. I do have to mention this, us, you know, we know we have the Winnipeg Sports Talk no, ticket package. No, no. I told you I was going to mention this. We're 0-3 going to games with the Winnipeg Sports Talk crew, and now we hold a watch party for a game, and the Jets lost again. Doesn't us. count. Does, Does not we're count. 0-4. We're 0-4. <laughs> we're 0-4. I don't know. I think it counts. So we, we have that game against Calgary later in the year. So I don't I yeah, listen, as it. far as that goes, I don't care if the Jets have their playoff f- uh, fortune completely determined by then. That is a must-win game for all of us. <laughs> April 5th against Calgary, when we see you again, we have to get that win uh when we're all together uh because 0 and 4 would be tough, especially when you consider how good this team's been all season long. <laughs> So, uh, but hey, no, tomorrow, last night, yellow card, great event, mere coincidence. We're not taking any responsibility for that. But yes, on the 5th of April, we got to get a win. Um, all right, let's get Rewiki in here. And uh, But yeah, by the way, um, and, and this is a not spawn, but I have to give a shout out to the folks at DeLuca's. Uh, James from Canadian Club is part of this. Uh, they did like these little charcuterie boxes with three different kind of meats, cheeses, fruit, um, uh, little bread things. It uh, blew blew my mind. You have a picture of it? I have a picture of it. Yeah, you were raving. You pulled out the grape. And this is not my, this is uh, something that I had not really uh, had before. Oh, yeah, we can't forget about the chocolate that was in it as well. Man, um, those grapes. Absolutely first class. Yeah, the grapes were like the size of little uh, tangerines or something like that. Those great. Yeah, you couldn't believe, believe that you were blown away at the grape size, but I was much, you know what I actually really liked in there? The dried fruit was really good for snacking yep. on during the game. And yeah, the assorted meats and cheeses, very well done. Uh, very, very I'm well done. I'm officially way more cultured today than I was at this point yesterday. Learned a lot. And Tish, the uh, CC ambassador, 37 years he's been doing it. Just absolutely stole yeah. the show. Um, and of course, Mike as well. Anyways, it was just a great, great night. Thank you again to everyone that came out and... Uh, I can't wait to get my hands on a little bit more of that CC. Uh, And a couple of them, she's actually on the, and we were always talking about that, the uh, invitation series, Sherry Cask. Her name is on the bottle of those those bottles right now. And I know, uh, I believe it was Dan uh, picked one up and I think got uh, Tish to sign it as well. It's like getting someone to autograph, an author to autograph a book. Uh, but um, anyways, thanks again to everyone. There's a couple more picks from uh, everything that went last night with our uh, great friends at, uh, at Canadian Club. All right, let's get Rewiki in here. Um, Ted Wyman's going to come up in about 20 minutes or so. We're going to get Ted's take on the uh, on the briar. Rue, what, uh, what's up, buddy? How are you? I'm uh, doing good. Apologies for the, for the delay. Uh, but, uh, yeah, chaos get, chaos get. at home? It, oh, it's everything, man. I don't even know what's going on. I, I thought I, I thought Friday was like four days ago. So <laughs> let's just do it. <laughs> um, you, you know what? You, you know what? You're a, a man of culture. Uh, you would have enjoyed the whiskey tasting last night going into uh, the game. The first period of the game wasn't very great, but uh, 
man, we had a good time. We'll make sure to get you out for the next time we do something like that with the friends at CC. That was right in your wheelhouse. Please, please. I saw the pictures. And I mean, the, the charcuterie was amazing. But I mean, come on. I haven't, haven't I, yeah, it, it would have been tough to, to keep it just to a whiskey tasting instead of a, a whiskey gulping. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely down to partake the next time you guys get into that. But that was, I was impressed. Like, that was... That was legitimate, like white linen service that you're providing there. That's you know what? That's that's, that's the way we do it at WST. I wasn't yeah. aware. I give more the uh, Canadian club folks the, the credit for all of that, but um, you know, it was really cool. We met a bunch of new people that are regular listeners, so uh, it all went off. The only thing that could have made the night better would be uh, a little bit better of a performance on the big screen by the visitors last night. Um, Listen, they've been winning games. It hadn't looked like they had been winning earlier on in the season. Uh, the power play had been a big part of it. But five on five, the team has slipped a little bit. We thought that this was oh, a perfect chance to step it up again and get ready to face a team that you may very well have to go through in the playoffs. And it didn't go. What were your, what were your takeaways from last night? Yeah, I would say my takeaway, Huss, is this is kind of the, the ultimate wake-up call right now. And... You could kind of gloss over, like you mentioned there, some of the wins and some of the losses, right? Where that, And it's funny, too. Looking back at their last 15 games, how many would you say the Jets played extremely good in? Like, there's the Vancouver game that pops to mind. Maybe one or two others. But regardless of win-loss record, like they, the process hasn't been all that great for, for quite some time now. But it kind of felt like, you know what? You go up against Dallas in their barn – looking for your first win against them this season, if, if you take care of business, you know, maybe we could push everything that happened in the, in, in the last few weeks aside and we can go, okay, this is, this is a team that can do some damage here. But I, I don't want to necessarily, you know, raise the alarm or anything like that, but I think it's a wake-up call that the team as constructed right now isn't going to be good enough to get it done come playoff time. I think part of that is external additions, and I think part of that is internally optimizing what this team has at their disposal right now. But if you think that we can just go over the next six weeks and you know what, we'll throw these guys over the boards time and time again. And what we did in the first half is going to be what happens ultimately, you know, moving forward in March and April and May. That's not going to cut it because Dallas right now is a clear step above, even though I thought the Jets played decently in the final 40. Um, and that was without Chris Tanev in the lineup and who knows what other additions they might make over the next week. But I, I just thought to me that was, okay, it's wake-up call time here. And, and what do we want to be and, and what do we want to do here? Because what we have and what we're throwing out there over the last handful of games is not working and it's not going to cut it up against Dallas, let alone potentially Colorado right now. But it seems to me, and, and I don't know if you feel the same way, that Dallas – might be the class of the West, let alone the the Central Division. Well, there's certainly a problem. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And, and and the ironic thing about this is that Dallas hadn't been particularly great. They got whooped by Colorado just a couple nights before. They lost at home to the Islanders in overtime on Monday to start the week. And, you know, despite the fact that we've had a lot of conversations going, you know, hey, the Jets won and you, you can't really get too upset about a team winning. That's what you go to do. They had won seven of eight. Like, you're exactly right. That was a wake-up call, and I'm telling you right now, this game tomorrow afternoon against the Carolina Hurricanes, albeit not in the West and not in the division, this is another test where you'll see, are you ready to play with the big boys and true Stanley Cup contenders? Yeah, and then the Hurricanes, too, are the ultimate. Like, if you don't want to bring the, the hard hat to work, Hope you're you guys screwed. enjoy a five-one ass kicking. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, <laughs> so the yeah the 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 level of competing all that better be at an all-time high against the Hurricanes. Um, and and they're kind of a great example of it too, us where they're they're starting to hit their stride in a big way. Like they were kind of coasting by the first thirty or forty games, and now they look like the juggernaut that everybody thought they might be going into the season here. So I mean, it's yeah, back-to-back litmus tests: one on the west, one on the east. Kind of a tough one there in terms of the the schedule. But again, like if if Carolina brings their A game, it might be wake up call 2.0 here that things things have got to change. And again, I think they have to change externally and then internally as well if this team wants to have a legit shot at going deep. Well, let's hit both sides of that uh, of that. Let's start internally. Um, 
listen, there's been a lot of talk about Cole Perfetti, um, the slump that he's in. And obviously he was front and center on, I would say, an unperfetti like play, uh, turning the puck over without really even being pressured that led directly to that first goal. Um, you know, listen, every young player goes through these sorts of things. And I would say that this for the first time for an extended period in his career, uh, when he has and has had a spot of quite prominent spot in the lineup, um, really up against it, obviously playing less minutes now on the fourth line. But uh, what does Cole need to turn it around? And, and and how important is that for the Winnipeg Jets if they want to? I mean, if you think about when the Jets were this team that was flirting with first place, not that they aren't right now, but looking the way that they looked, establishing their foundation. Let's not forget Cole Perfetti was playing big minutes. was a big, big part of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like all the underlying numbers in that first half, it's like he's a legitimate piece here, right? And I, I even with his struggles and, and probably what I'm about to say, you know, I, I still think he's going to be an impactful player for the franchise for a long, long time. But I, I don't have a problem with how Bones has handled him over the past couple of games, putting him on the fourth line. Honestly, Hus, and, and maybe this is <laughs> watching the way Torrance has handled youngsters in Philly this year. I, I, I think a healthy scratch for a game or two wouldn't have been the worst thing in the world for him either. Um, you know, a lot of people look at a scratch as almost like a referendum on, on who a player is. Oh, if he's scratched, he's never going to be who, what kind of a top liner gets scratched. But I, I, I just, I watch him play and I just, the, the word that comes up when I watch Perfetti on the ice is he just looks tired. Like I think mentally and physically, he's just a step behind it right now. And, and maybe that, plays a role into that giveaway in, in the first period leading to that goal where it's like, like you said, an unperfetti like mistake, you know, it's, it's hard for a young guy. Like he's 21, 22 and he's playing 50, 60 games for the first time in his career. Um, you know, he's probably banged up bruised. Like basically everybody in the NHL is right now. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> it's difficult. And you're going to see fluctuations like that in somebody's game. And I, I, I kind of wondered if maybe having a game or two off, just to, here's a reset. You don't have to worry about pressure or expectations or anything like that. And then you come at it, refresh and revitalize, and then maybe he gives you a bit of a spark. Lower down the lineup, and if need be, you can throw him back up a little bit higher. Um, but I, I to, to me, it just looks like he might need, maybe time on the fourth line is good. But I, again, wouldn't necessarily be opposed to just giving him a break. Giving him a bit of a breather. It does here. seem like there's a bit of a crisis of confidence uh, in the young man. I actually bumped into him leading the game. Like this is about a, I don't know, a week ago or so, one of the home games, and you know he was out of the room pretty early, and you could just tell that he was um, he was stressing uh, about everything. And I, I listen, I don't necessarily disagree with you. I mean, you want to do whatever you can do to get Perfetti back to uh, the best version of him to help the team as you get closer to the playoffs and you know, the time is sort of dwindling, uh, dwindling down. Um, it, you mentioned internal things. Um, listen, we already talked with Ken about the potential of McGrody joining the club. We saw what Stan Coven's doing right now yeah. for Dallas. I mean, I really do think he could be a jolt of energy. And again, we're not talking about going in and Hey, welcome to the NHL plopping him on the top line or the second line. But I, I am, Listen, I'm betting that he will, look, assuming he signs, I'm betting he will play, and I'm betting that he will play well enough that he'll be part of the mix when it comes to the playoffs. But outside of him, who's you know still does not have a contract yet, when you speak of internal things that may need to happen moving forward, uh, where are you zooming in on? Yeah, no, I was, I was the same way watching State COVID. It's like, do we got one of those in the system that we can just call up and get rid like that? He's a player. He is going to be, it's, it's wild that they've waited this long to call him up. If he's, you know, what, like, I mean, he's just been a lot great season in Austin with the stars this oh, year. He he's, he's, he's fun to watch. Um, I mean, to, to me, it's, and again, it's, you don't want to kind of label it as it's all one person's fault, but it is kind of hard to ignore the fact that, you know, Kyle Connor comes back into the lineup off his injury and that coincides almost perfectly with the Jets recent struggles here. Um, I just don't know how you can't look at the mountain of data that's starting to pile up here and continue to trot out this iteration of your top line 
and think that you're going to be successful for the next month and a half of the season. I mean, it's they're they're, they're just they're they're getting killed out there for the most part, right? And I, I think Connor has an important part to play on the power play. There's no doubt about that. And having Shifley, Connor Velarde on the power play is 1,000 percent the way to go moving forward. But I, I I just I feel at this point like you need to see a bit of a shakeup in your lineup. And I actually think Connor and, and Monaghan would perform pretty well together. Like, I, I think they can play well off of each other. I think stylistically they can complement each other's games very well. And you're putting Connor in a more advantageous position on top of it, being on more of a sheltered scoring line. And I, I just think we've seen Shifley, Ehlers, Velarde for, you know, a decent enough amount of time to get that trio back together Make sure that the tilt of play is going in Winnipeg's favor if that top line is going to be playing 20 minutes a night. And we see if that's the way that we can fix this thing. Because as it stands right now, it's it's just it's it's difficult. It's the there's not much margin for error when your when your first line's getting borderline caved in on a night to night basis. And I think that's to me internally maybe the quickest solution here. Um, but on top of potentially a McGrory coming in, I still do think this team. If they, if they want to go up and, and say that our lineup looks better than a Dallas or Colorado, I still believe like th- that they need to make another wing addition to bring somebody else in to help supplement their, their You know what the funniest goal. thing about this conversation with the top line is? And, I mean, if someone was just sort of like not watching the games or very casually, they'd be listening to this conversation and going, what the hell are you idiots talking about? Kyle Connor had the game-winning goal in the last three games, and they're, oh, power play. <laughs> None of them were on the power play. Like, like when you, if you look at the points and what he and those those three players in particular, and again, a big part of it has been the power play, they have been getting theirs. I mean, to be honest, I'm not as much worried about their production offensively. It is about their ability to have the puck a little bit more and to not get caved in on shifts yeah. and to not be chasing the puck around. Um, you know, we saw a game turn around with a two goal lead a couple games ago when they got hemmed in for about a minute and a half. Next thing you know, Maselli's putting it in on a tap in at the side of the net and it's game on and the Coyotes are right back in. Like it, it it's a strange it's a scenario. And the other thing, and I know people have talked about that, like from Bones's perspective, it's probably pretty tough to split up a line that are playing together on the power play as well, having that sort of chemistry and getting those other points. But I mean, to your example, when you look at every shift over the course of the game and what you want out of your top line, um, they haven't had the puck enough and they haven't had it in the offensive zone enough. Um, So, you know, it, it obviously brings up this conversation but because of what they had been doing offensively, I wasn't expecting it, and fairly or unfairly, or maybe unfortunately, sometimes it takes a couple really bad games and really bad stretches where you're not finding ways to win, where finally the coach says, all right, you know what, we're shaking things up. Exactly, right? And it's never a question of are they going to produce offensively for you. It's just going to be, are you coming up plus or minus on the on the margins there, right? And I mean, look at... You know, if, if you look at a team and their top line is getting outshot, outchance, outscored, would you say that's a successful top line or a line that you want to look to try to find a way to improve on? I think the answer there is is pretty obvious, right? And so while there, there there's definite moments of brilliance, I, I do think that there might even be a bit of a trickle-down effect where if your top line's not spending a whole lot of time in the offensive zone, well, guess where line two is going to spend their next shift? More than likely in their half of the ice. Line three, guess what? And and so on and so on, right? So I, I'll I'll be intrigued to see if it's gonna happen against Carolina or if maybe wake up call 2.0 is gonna happen there and, and maybe a change is made after that. But yeah, I, I don't know. It it just feels to me like finding more consistent play out of the top line, not even necessarily production, but just tilting the ice a little bit more could go a long way to getting this team back to where they were a couple of weeks ago, um, a couple of months ago. I know bones. I mean, they want that second line to be going. And I, I really like the early returns on Ehlers, Monaghan, Ayafalo. And I will say for the record, and I think I've said this a number of times before, if you're asking me how the, does, does the second line look better as the ability to carry play and, you know, be on the right side of that ledger, with Nikolai Ehlers or Kyle Connor, I'll go with Ehlers. Um, 
but I'm, I would not be adverse to, to seeing the way it looked uh, for a little bit. I still kind of feel like he wanted to give those guys a little bit of a run together to play. Um, but again, we all know what's going to cause change and have him turn around. It's, you know, a couple miserable games and uh, they just had one that didn't look very good. And you mentioned wake up call 2.0. I mean, uh, <laughs> you better be ready uh, top to bottom in that lineup to take on the uh, the Carolina Hurricanes tomorrow. As far as next Friday goes, um, you know, I kind of asked Ken, like, what do you think Chevy's takeaway is last night, you know, on a big test game and seeing the team play the way they did and with the result that they had against the Dallas Stars. And he said, hey, you know, this is a more of a big picture. Uh, they've been thinking about this for a long time. One game isn't going to change around. But they've made one move. I think it's pretty clear that, this is not a finished product just yet. I mean, uh, when you look at the team and think of the general manager, where are they looking uh, when it comes to potential move or moves before next Friday's deadline? Well, I mean, to me, there's only two real areas of concern right now, and that would be another, let's just call it a top six winger, but another impact winger, whatever you want to term that as, and then a boost to the second pair. Like that, that to me is the only spot you'd be looking at. I, I don't think <laughs> top six forwards and top four defensemen, those are sort of significant ads. <laughs> sort of significant. Yeah. It's look, like, but I, the, the reason I say that is I don't think depth pieces are going to help this team. Like I think they've got more than enough supplementary players that, that, that can come in around the, the, the edges there that can come in and, and, and do the job and get the job done. But man, it's going to be hard to, to get both of those without breaking the bank. And I, I just don't know if there, there's, there's two players out there available that you would be comfortable going all in on. So I don't know if this is right or not. To me, it kind of feels like an either or situation. Which way do you want to go about it? I, I still think getting some help up front is the way to go with this team. Like you've got, you've got Hardabuck, right? Like, like Hellebuck's going to be the safety valve behind you. And we've seen Pionk and Dylan give you good enough play. I know the past handful of weeks haven't been all that great, but I just think there still is a little bit of a lack of a, a clinical finish up front and and finding a piece to come in there. I mean, my my pick for a long time has been Jordan Everly. I've been banging that drum. Seattle's falling out of the playoff picture, so so maybe that's a possibility for the Jets. Um, but I'm still pushing my chips towards getting some more help up front. If they, I mean, if, if, if reinforcements come in on the back end, beauty, let's go. But to me, finding another piece up front and, and doing that also alleviates the need and, and the pressure of needing a Cole Perfetti to perform in his first extended playoff action, right? Having Alex Iafallo drop down below further in the lineup, I think would be a good thing for this forward group. So I still think that finding a piece to come in there and then maybe McGrory on top of that too would put this team in, in, in a pretty decent spot going into the stretch run. Uh, what, uh, what's cooking on uh, skates and plates heading into the weekend? Yeah, delaying that too. I'm just delaying all over the place, but that that'll come out tomorrow morning. So so we'll get a new episode out on some the pregame listening. The some pregame there listening heading into Carolina and uh, Buffalo. Uh, Brew, great having you on the program, I'm, and it'll be a fun conversation next week. We'll uh, chop it up as we head into the buzzer on Friday afternoon for uh, the trade deadline in the NHL. You have a great one, buddy. Yeah, you too. All right, we'll talk soon. There's uh, Brandon or Wiki. Follow. Uh, Hammond, make sure you're checking out Skates and Plates wherever you get your favorite pods. Uh, we're going to open up marbles in about 15 minutes, but we're going to take a uh, step away from uh, from the pucks for a minute, but stay on the ice and hit the pebble with Ted Wyman. Uh, Briar get go- gets going tonight. And, uh, of course, Princess Auto, proud sponsors of both Team Jennifer Jones and... Our pal Reed Carruthers, who's going to have Brad Jacobs throwing fourth rocks. Princess Auto, uh, not just the home of the Bombers at Princess Auto Stadium and those great tailgates, but also a proud sponsor of the uh, Players' Cup, as well as a couple of Manitoba's top curling teams. Princess Auto is also the place where you'll find the uh, best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Pop by and see them on Panet Road or Portage Avenue West locations today. And you can always shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. The gang at Royal Sports is ready for another big weekend. Lots of new merch coming in by the day. 
on both the Royal and the King Skate Snow and Surf side. Uh, but as we get ready for playoffs, you're going to want to head down to check out the biggest and best selection of Winnipeg Jets merchandise in the city. Tons of exclusives you can't find anywhere else. And all the variations of Winnipeg Jet jerseys can be customized with your favorite player's name and number down at Royal Sports. Check out the Bomber gear, Blue Jays getting ready for the season, and of course, hockey, snowboarding, so much more. All waiting for you at Royal, 750 Pemina Highway. And follow them on Instagram as well, at Royal Sports Pemina, for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And as we bring in Ted Wyman, hey, if you're thinking about a great spot to watch the game tomorrow afternoon, Sunday night, maybe mix in a little curling as well, what better place to do it than your local Boston pizza, ice-cold schooners, world-famous BP wings, gourmet pizzas, and more. And if you are staying at home, you can always get it hot and fresh to your door by ordering online at bostonpizza.com. All right, it's Briar time. Let's bring in Ted for the Ted Wyman Briar preview. Teddy, what's up, buddy? Great to have you back on the program. How are you? I'm good, my friend. Good to see you as well. It's been quite a, a curling season so far, hasn't it? I mean, if the Briar even comes close to the intensity and the news headlines that came out of the Scotties, it's going to be doing pretty well. Well, you know what, just quickly, I mean, we haven't spoken this week, so let's go back up to, uh, to the Scotties. I mean, uh, it started off in a bizarre, bizarre way with the Brianne Harris um, ineligibility ruling. Still nothing on that. Um, Carrie Anderson for the first time in four years, didn't win the whole thing. And yet there she was at the end going toe to toe, blow for blow with Rachel Holman, who was the big favorite in the event. Jen Jones still thrilling curling fans one more time at the Scotties. It really was an incredible tournament. Yeah, it was the gift that kept on giving. I'll tell you for the Winnipeg Sun website, I don't think curling numbers have ever been higher at any newspaper in history. I mean, I'm telling you, man, people were into that Scotties. And of course, the Breon Harris story has so much to do with that. People are still re reading my stories on that. And I don't have anything new to report on it. It's as much a mystery to me as it is to anybody, at least in terms of things that we can actually report. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's um, that that just created this interesting scene around the Scotties from what I was told from some of my colleagues who were there. It was really intense. And then you had Rachel Holman going on a historic run. I mean, that's got this has got to be one of the best seasons in the history of curling. They're 48 and five. <laughs> I mean, come on, that's incredible. And they go 11 and 0 in the Scotties. They beat Jones three times, two epic games in the playoffs. And then Jennifer Jones walks off into the sunset, cradling her two kids as she retires from women's curling. I mean, the stories just don't get much better than that. Um, when are we gonna find out about this Harris thing? Like this can't just go on forever, can it? Like, uh, well, ineligible, move along. No, it can't go forever. And, you know, my understanding, like I listened to what uh, Nolan Thiessen had to say on the broadcast last week. He's the CEO of Curling Canada. He hasn't been willing to talk about this at all with any of us, saying the same thing that they said in their press release, which is uh, they've been told by a third party that they can't comment on it. Um, but he said it's going to be resolved uh, sooner or sooner than later, I think. That's the impression that I got. Um, there are certainly some deadlines if it if it were a certain, you know, it's just it just I, I can't really say too much yeah. about it. You know, that's the thing, Andrew. I mean, it's like it's a it's a it's a it's a wild story. It's incredible that it's gone this way. It's crazy that there's this much secrecy. I don't you know, I understand that the curlers appreciate that there's privacy in this situation for the, the person in question. But I do not understand in a day and age when we have had so many scandals in sports that there's still this kind of secrecy when there's so much interest in it. And it's like, uh, I was reading a story today in the Globe and Mail and they said something to the effect of, you know, it's like basically saying the starting goalie in a hockey game in, in a playoff series or the Stanley Cup final is not eligible, but we're not gonna tell you why. And it just doesn't, it doesn't sit well with people, doesn't sit well with me. I think this has to be cleared up soon. And I think policies, not just at Curling Canada, because they seem to have their hands tied here at the higher level, whoever's making these decisions, those policies need to be reviewed. I am a, I am a huge fan 
of Kerry and Team Anderson. I was pulling for them. How much do you think that that affected them at the at the event last week? Kristen Kerwaki was the All Star lead. She so was nails, absolutely. I just think that they, you know, they weren't in the same stratosphere all season as Rachel Holman. I don't think they were ever winning this event. Holman was just that damn good. Yep, I really think that. And Jones with her young team. I mean, they've been in the final two years in a row. Why is she retiring again? <laughs> it's it's pretty incredible. Um, hey, speaking of that, I think there was a lot of speculation that uh, Mackenzie Zacharias was going to come back to join the Jones rink now that she's uh, ring. But I read an article on the, on the last 24 hours or so, um, kind of her first interview. It doesn't sound like that's uh, in the plan for her. No, that was a story written by my podcast partner greg strong from the riser podcast he uh he's canadian press writer and he got mackenzie on the phone which is a pretty good job by him because i've been trying that for a long time to get her to really explain why she wasn't part of that team anymore didn't think she sounded all that uh interested at all in in rejoining that team even though her sister's on that team um pretty disillusioned with something that happened uh, as they went on a run to the final of the Scotties last year and uh, pretty happy with her situation of not being involved in high level curling at the moment. So um, I was surprised. I thought she might be coming back too, but I guess that's not going to be the case. All right. Let's uh, look at the Briar. Uh, we've got the uh, Carruthers team with Brad Jacobs throwing last rock uh, representing Manitoba. And of course, Matt Dunstone, the Manitoba representative, uh, I was, you know, and we'll get into this in a bit over at Cool Bet. They've got all the odds. It's still Brad Gushu as the favorite. It seems like certainly by the bookmakers, you've got four teams, four top elite teams. Gushu, the favorite. Next is Botcher, then Dunstone, then Kevin Cooey, and then a pretty big gap against the rest of the field. I mean, uh, from following this tour and these teams all year long, is that a pretty accurate way to describe it? Four top teams and, you know, any team below that would be maybe um, punching above their weight class, at least from what they've done so far this year? I'd like to say six, honestly. I mean, I think if you're if you're only saying four, you're not including Carruthers and you're not including Mike McEwen. Mike McEwen's the home team. Saskatchewan hasn't won in 44 years. This is one of their best chances. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with Colton Flash. He had a great run himself as Skip just two years ago. Um, McEwen is always close, but he hasn't won the big one. So maybe, you know, that you know that might be the real knock there. And uh, Reed Carruthers, I mean, he's Brad Jacobs isn't just throwing four stone. He's skipping. He's calling the game. He's he's now the man. And Reed is, is playing third. They kept their name, I guess, for branding and whatnot, which is, uh, you know, I think that works. Uh, it's being allowed more in curling than it used to be. You used to basically have to call yourself whatever your uh, skip, uh, whatever the skip's name was, the person who was calling the game. But uh, I think they are a team that certainly can contend. And Brad Jacobs, if he gets hot, I mean, that guy's been in the playoffs of the Briar more times than most people have ever been to the Briar, right? Like, I mean, he plays an awful lot. Uh, of big games throughout his career. Hasn't won the big one since they won the Olympics in 2014, but he did win an Olympic gold medal. So <laughs> that's pretty impressive. And he's won the Briar before. I think that team's got a real shot. And and I mean, my favorite for this event is Brendan Botcher. I think that team reminds me very much of Rachel Holman's team in terms of their trajectory. It's a new team last year. So it was Holman's because they added uh, Tracy Flurry. It takes a little while to build up. To, you know, that first year sometimes is a bit of a write-off for these new teams. And then they really start to put it together in the second year. And this Botcher team, man, it's built for success. Like Mark Kennedy at third, you've got Brett Gallant at second, you've got Ben Hebert at lead. Are there better players at any of those positions in the sport? I mean, it's hard to imagine. They, they're certainly among the most decorated of all time. And, you know, that's an incredible front end. Mark Kennedy's got to be the best, one of the best vices that's ever played the game. Brendan Botcher is a sharpshooter himself and, uh, and has won a briar. Uh, they've been the best team in Canada, and that's my pick to win it. I think Gushu will be incredibly tough to knock off, but I do think Botcher can get it done. And uh, Matt Dunstone, don't uh, forget. Obviously, yeah, I don't want to count him uh, out because he was great last year too. Well, I wanted to get to the Dunstone rink. Tell us about you know their season, and uh, they come in as the third favorite in this event, uh, representing Manitoba. I mean uh, – um, where is that team at, and what do you think of their chances to uh, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with those top two teams that you mentioned or at the top of the yeah. favorite board? One thing I liked about what Matt said when I talked to him on the phone the other day as he was driving out to Regina, 
he said that, um, you know, being pre-qualified for this event is a huge advantage to them. And he pointed to the success of other teams that have been pre-qualified in recent years. And it's, I mean, this is who's winning. Rachel Holman was pre-qualified. Jennifer Jones was pre-qualified. The three years before that, Carrie Anderson was pre-qualified. Brad Gushu won pre-qualified last year. The year before, he didn't even have to play in provincials because they didn't have them due to COVID. The year before that is the same. You, you've got teams that are, uh, um, you know, we're getting in on their CTRS points, knowing all season long that they're going to be in the briar and focusing their entire season on it. I think that's what Matt Dunstone's team has done. And I think they feel like they're really in a good spot going in here. The only issue is that Botcher was pre-qualified as well. Gushu was pre-qualified as well. You know, they're, they're, those two teams are so hard to beat. But I think Dunstone showed last year that he's got the game to do it and he's got the team to do it. Um, they came awfully close. And he's going to win a Briar one day, Huss. I can't tell you which day it'll be, but it's going to happen. Hopefully it's next weekend. Uh, <laughs> we'll lie. There'll be a lot of people pulling for him. Um, but you mentioned the Manitoba teams, and it, it is still – like I look at these, we're getting ready, I'm like, oh, Saskatchewan, and I forget. Like it's just so bizarre – that Mike McEwen is the skip of the Saskatchewan team. Um, but to me, the most intriguing team is the Carruthers rink with Brad Jacobs skipping. I mean, you make a great point. Right? Like when he is on, he's as good as anybody on the planet. And I think the knock on that team is that they've looked really good at times and then they haven't looked as good. Like their consistency has been nowhere near the teams at the top. But can oh. you put that together for 10 days in Regina? Well, they seem to be able to do it at the points bet. So, I mean, they've won the points bet twice. One time it wasn't with uh, Brad Jacobs and one time it was. But they're, they're not uh, – they haven't been as consistent as the seasons that season has gone on. And there's been a lot of change within that team over the last few years. You know, they had Jason Gunlickson, then he's out. Um, and then they played with three in the in – the, in the, uh, uh, by Terra Championship last year, and then they went into the Briar with a replacement player. Um, then they bring in Jacobs. Then they switch Jacobs to Skip. I mean, Reed Crothers has gone back and forth from Skip to to third about five times in the last five years. He did it a couple of times when he was playing with Mike McEwen as well. So they need to really find their lane and stay in it, I think, when it comes to what the makeup of the team is. And then we'll see just how far they can go. But certainly they have the opportunity to get hot right here, right now. And, I, you know, I'm not counting them out either. I mean, obviously, you have to pick a winner. And I think Botcher is just that little bit better than everybody else. But we haven't even mentioned Kevin Cooey. And, I mean, he's 49 years old, just like Jennifer Jones. He's still one of the top sharpshooters in the game, and he's got two of the best young players in the country on his team in Tyler Tardy and Jacques Gauthier, who are cousins, by the way, in case you guys didn't know that. Uh, but they are, uh, you know, Jacques is from Winnipeg and Tyler Tardy from BC, and they have uh, formed a really excellent team there with Kevin Cooey and also Carrick Martin, who's an excellent sweeper at lead. So no way am I counting that team out either. I talked to Brad Gushu yesterday, and he said it's as wide open as he can remember. They love the fact that the top teams, the top seven teams in the country are there, um, despite you know having to use provincial representation still in the Briar, which is a good thing. It's good that they're still happening, but they're managed to find a, a way now with the CTRS teams and the expanded field to get all of the top teams in there. And you can pretty much say any of those top six is going to get in there. And Brad Gushu even mentioned Aaron Sluchinski out of Alberta as being a dark horse contender. You know, uh, Rob Mahoney in chat saying, wait, I thought Mike McEwen was skipping Ontario. I'm so confused where these Winnipeggers are playing. Oh, there's lots of them. Um, he's the Ted, nomad. Yeah, yeah, he's been bouncing around like many of the uh, the guys, but this is what it's all about, trying to win that Briar, represent Canada at the Worlds and you know, get your name in for those Olympic trials as we uh, as we move forward. We were talking about this earlier on in the week, and I don't know whether you know the answer to this, but what gets better TV ratings, the Scotties or the Briar? Well, I, I don't know the answer to it, but I would be shocked if it's not the Scotties. I mean, I, I'm telling you, I talked to my boss about this today because he was talking about those incredible curling numbers on our website that I brought up to you. Um, and he said that, you know, the Briar stuff doesn't seem to be moving the needle as much. And I said, it's definitely not. There, there's definitely a certain interest in women's curling 
that I don't know that goes to men's curling uh, in terms of, uh, I think maybe more casual uh, fans of curling might be interested in the women's side. I think a lot of that has to do with Jennifer Jones's popularity. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with Rachel Homan and, and her team and uh, just the, the familiarity that they, they've built over all these years and the skill. Carrie Anderson's team as well, that familiarity really works in terms of building up a fan base. And I, I get the sense, and I mean, I honestly can't tell you for sure. I might be wrong, but I get the sense that there was, at least in this year's Scotty's, more interest in the women's than there is in the men's. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm with you uh, 100%. I mean, I'll watch both. But I just find that, and you know, I think you're right. I mean, a lot of the personalities, of course, Carrie's team, I mean, winning four straight times, never mind the craziness of what happened right before they started. Um, I, I'd almost wish the Briar was first, and then they went into the Scotties, and that sort of seemed like the main event. I would push for that personally, but uh, it should be good. All right, Marbles is open, by the way, exclamation mark Marbles. Get your registration in there in the YouTube chat. Um, before we go, Ted, Give us a, a Ted Wyman bold prediction or two. You think Botcher probably is the team to win? Um, you know, we, uh, between Mike McEwen and Reed Carruthers ring, who's got a better chance of maybe playing, you know, being in the top three, if you will, and uh, anything else that you might be uh, liking? I gave it to McEwen. I was picking between the two, whether they were going to make my top five most likely teams to win. I gave it to McEwen because they are the home team. Um, they're in Regina. They have great curling fans in Regina. You know the place is going to be filled with people in green, and I do think that that can give them a bit of a boost. And like I said, he's got a really good team there uh, with Colton Flash playing third. Um, so I like their odds of getting in. I mean, all of those six teams that we talked about could make the playoffs, and, I mean, if I was going to pick it, that's exactly the six that I would What is the format, pick. by the way? It's the same as the Scotties. Six teams make it, no tiebreakers, so last stone draw means a ton. Uh, and then uh, that's the crossover play where the first and second place teams in each pool get a chance to play a game that uh, one the winner goes straight into the 1-1 one, one game, the loser drops down and gets to play again. If you finish third in your pool on either side, then you're in an elimination situation right away. I, I like the format, I do, and a lot of the players do as well. Um, you mentioned that last stone draw. Can you explain that? And I didn't really yeah. know about that until the insanity of the five-way tie at four and four in which Caitlin Laws won won the break. Like, yeah. is it is it of draws in games on the last straw, or they, they do that before? I pre -game. explain it. So it's pre-game, and this happened. I mean, honestly, it happened to the Jennifer Jones team with Caitlin Laws at third at the Olympics. It, it, they were dead last in last stone draw out of all of the 10 teams in the field. And they got into a tiebreaker situation at the end of the round robin, and they lost. And Eve Muirhead, who was, had the same record as them, got into the playoffs and won the gold medal. So, I mean, it is incredibly valuable, that, uh, that uh, last stone draw situation. It's not the number one determining factor. That's head-to-head. -head. So if two teams are tied, the head-to-head -head winner goes. And that's an easier format. But if three teams are tied, then it has to be, and they're all one-on-one -on -one against each other, then it has to go, um, you know, it has to go to the last stone draw. And I don't really like it. It came down from the World Curling Federation. Um, they decided this wasn't going to be a thing anymore. Uh, they believe that it is better for their scheduling, for their television. They don't want to have the risk of having to have a, a tiebreaker game at 11 p.m. and then another one at 8 a.m., um, and, and go through all that. So they've decided that's just not going to happen anymore, and you're going to go straight to these last stone draws. Now, the fact is those last stone draws are thrown before each game. Um, they're recorded. They're cumulative. So if you think at that, as Jones's team did at the Olympics, you really put yourself in a bad position. But Caitlin Laws had the very best last stone draw cumulative results at the Scotties, and therefore – she comes through in a five-way tie. So you cannot, in my mind, um, downplay the importance of those last stone draws before games. And to be totally honest, it's kind of surprising to me that TSN doesn't even show them. I mean, like maybe That's the just... the thing for the casual oh, fans. You're like, we have no idea what's going on. Yeah. I mean, rather than show the first few rocks of the first end, why don't you say, here's what happened with the last stone draw. 
And now we know sort of who is in the lead and who's having the best run. I think they're crazy not to show it. It would make people more interested in watching the early parts of the game. And, and honestly, they need to make that more clear to people what those standings are so people can, uh, you know, know what's coming. Because as you said, you were surprised when all of a sudden there was a five-way tie and this is what happened. Yeah, that like I had no much idea. I'd been paying attention to it because I guess they don't see it. And I'll say this, uh, TSN does an amazing job, uh, you know, putting on these bond spiels and, and, and televising things. Um, that's the, the one complaint that I would have. By the way, Vic Router, a game in full effect last week in the Scotties. I mean, uh, our pal Vic still has it. <laughs> the awesome. smoothest there is, and uh, and and great people around him as well. They they do a fantastic job covering curling, and I am not suggesting anything other than that. But to me, if these last stone draws are going to be this important, you may as well show them. No doubt about it. Hey, listen, uh, Ted, always great having you on the program. Just uh, before we go on the way out, not curling related, uh, I know you spent a lot of time on the bomber beat for the Winnipeg Sun. Uh, this really, really sad news about Craig Rowe this week. I mean, uh, kind of came out of the blue, shocked a lot of people, myself included. I mean, he was such a big part of that 2019 team that uh, broke the, the the Grey Cup drought here. Um, just shocking for such a, you know, a young man, a healthy, atoned football player uh, to be gone so early. Uh, happening the same week is, of course, the memorial for uh, the legendary Kenny Plain. Yeah, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. And one of the reasons I was shocked more shocked than maybe um I, I would have been is because like i follow him on social media and he was posting things about his defensive line university just a few days before this news came out so i had no idea that he was as sick as he was i i, I think a lot of people didn't um adam big hill certainly did as a good friend of his some of the bomber players knew as well uh that what was going on and were you know like obviously uh trying to do what they could to support his family. But it's honestly, uh, for a guy at 33 years old, it just should not happen. And uh, it's pretty devastating. And, you know, my my heart goes out to his family. I got to know Craig a little bit, a really nice guy, great guy to talk to. His wife was pretty active when she was in Winnipeg and was known by quite a lot of people. So um, they were only here for a very short time. But I think they made an impact. And, and as a result, there's a lot of people with heavy hearts. No doubt about it. Um, Ted, I am looking forward to uh, everything you've got coming in the sun for the next week coming out of Regina for the Briar. Thanks so much for doing this, and uh, maybe we'll check in next week and uh, see how the Manitobans and the Winnipeg expats are doing as well in uh, the biggest men's tournament of the year in the country. Yeah, we'll be following it all very closely and uh, hope that people read as much about men's curling as they did about women's curling. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Keep it up, pal, and appreciate your time as always. All right, see us. Oh, man, love our chats with Teddy. Uh, great to have him on the program. And, uh, yes, you can read Teddy Drip's uh, curling coverage, which was uh, breaking records through the Scotties over at the uh, Winnipeg Sun website and in the Winnipeg Sun. Well, it, it last call for marbles. Well, not last call, but just get him in. We're going to do the cool bet lines, and then we'll get going. Uh, but it's Friday afternoon. I wish I had one with me, like, right here, but uh, let's crack one to the weekend. Uh, might I suggest a 1919 or generic lager from our friends at Little Brown Jug. Uh, nothing makes the weekend better than a cold beer, and there's no better local beer than a Little Brown Jug. You know where to find them, 330 William Avenue, down at the brewery and tap room, or uh, wherever they have great beer. Friday, Saturday, the weekend, or any day, make it LBJ. Um, I do have to get to uh, the cool bet lines in just a minute, but uh, let's get Remo back in here for a sec. Reem, um, I, I, listen, Ted's one of our favorites. I could chop it up with him on a whole bunch of subjects, but it, it is funny. And I mean, I didn't know that, but I can't say that I'm surprised that it has been record-breaking traffic when it comes to the Scotties. And a lot of it comes out of the crazy situation with Brianne Harris and Kerry Anderson's team beginning it. But, you know, when you think about the Briar and the Scotties, I mean, I got to say the women's game just has way more of the personalities, the characters that I think draw people to the tube. Yeah, well, I think the, ga the games were incredible, too. Um, totally. They went down to the final throw with Rachel Homan and Jennifer Jones on Saturday and Sunday. And you have a legend like Jennifer Jones uh, with this incredible run. And Rachel Homan's been very good. 
for a long time as well. So I and again, you had a lot of very good teams. Kerry Einerson won the last four, and a lot of Manitoba teams as well with Caitlin Laws in there too, and Cameron. So I can see why at the Winnipeg Sun you would have a lot of interest. And as far as ratings go, I can't really find anything. Usually TSN puts out a press release after every run, patting themselves on the back, saying how many people watch it. I mean, every, everyone does that. The proverbial Barry Horowitz, including us, we'll be putting out uh, putting out one of those. Next week for our three-year anniversary, <laughs> yes, letting everyone will. know what we're doing here. But uh, Devin Haru, who follows curling and Olympic sports for CBC, uh, he said in 2019, this is what he tweeted in 2019, that the average viewership for the Briar was slightly over the Scotties, but in the playoffs, uh, the women had slightly more. And then the final, I mean, this is obviously depending on the game of or the match of that year and if it was close or not but the final was way up like a 90,000 no no sorry just over 100,000 more for the Scotties final versus the Briar but that I think that I don't know what the match was in 2019 if it's if it's not close like you're not tuning in all the way to the end and in the Scotties it was at least this year went down to the wire it was incredible oh. Well, and, and I mean, for the end of Jennifer Jones' uh, Hall of Fame career to be uh, going toe to toe with the dominant Holman Rink, who had owned women's curling all season long, they it couldn't have set up better for the broadcast or for curling fans. And to be honest, it doesn't surprise me that they're close because I think people that love watching curling on television will do it, whether it's the women or whether it's the men. Um, well, let's uh, do a little pivot over to. The cool bet lines for uh, for today, and uh, I'll tell you what, gang. If you want to get in a few uh, bets on the Briar, cool bet has he covered, and you'll need to do that before six o'clock tonight when things get going. Uh, I sort of alluded to this when talking to uh, to Ted, but here's how things shake out. Uh, this is to win the event. Brad Gushu, representing Canada, as Team Canada for the defending champ, are the favorites at plus one fifty. Ted's pick, the Botcher Rink, <clears throat> is plus 185. Matt Dunstone from Manitoba, plus 330. Kevin Cooey, plus 525. And again, that's kind of what I said. There's like four teams and there's a gap. It's a huge gap in odds. Uh, but if you're looking to maybe throw a, throw a Hail Mary, Mike McEwen in Saskatchewan, who Ted thinks are very capable, 26 to 1 and Reed Carruthers representing Manitoba with Brad Jacobs skipping and throwing the last stone 28 to 1. Uh Ontario's 30, the other Alberta Shlashinsky rink is 35 to 1. Uh then we go to BC 200, Quebec 400 and uh everybody else a miracle if you will. Um you, there's they've got the, you can bet a team to be champion, top 2, top 3 or top 4. Um, there's also the numbers on qualifying from pool play. Uh, the Carruthers rink is minus 125. Mike McEwen in Saskatchewan minus 152 on that. Obviously huge numbers for the others. Uh, you can bet province of winning team. Alberta's at minus 104, and you get the three teams, but specifically the Cooey rink and the Botcher rink. Manitoba, which includes both the Carruthers rink and Matt Dunstone, plus 280. Uh, we've got the exact final matchup. I think I'm going to look at the... I, I like the... And again, this is fading Gushu a little bit, which is tough, but you don't want to go with the chalk. A botcher Dunstone final at plus 385, I think might get a little sprinkle. Um, there's total over-unders for all the teams in the pool play. Uh, they've got so much. The guy, Our guy Hot Dog over at Coolbet does an incredible job at handicapping the curling, so... If you do want to throw a little wager on the curling, get over to CoolBet. Use the promo code WST if you haven't played there before uh, for a 100% bonus, up to 200 bucks on your first deposit. As far as the uh, NHL tonight, there's three games. The Coyotes looking to finally get a win are in Ottawa, Arizona, I believe still without Clayton Keller. They're plus 160. The Sens are minus 190. Huge game tonight in the East. Philly at Washington. Washington desperately needs this game. They could get to within four points of the Flyers with a win. A regulation loss for Philly would put them eight clear of the Caps. Washington's a plus 117 home dog. Philly minus 138. 
And then the final game tonight, uh, the Devils, who uh, just rocked the Sharks the other day, and the Ducks and Sharks played last night. Devils are in the duck pond to take on the quack attack. Minus 264 for New Jersey. Anaheim, plus 220. We do have odds for the Jets game tomorrow already. Uh, and the Canes are minus 143 favorites. The Jets are plus 122 underdogs. Again, Hellebuck going for the Winnipeg Jets tomorrow. And then the Jets will take on the Buffalo Sabres on Sunday. Sabres coming off a nice OT win in Tampa last night against the Lightning. Uh, but a big, big day of games tomorrow in the National Hockey League with one, we got five, we got ten. 13 games in total, kicking it off with the Jets and Canes. And I still can't get over that start time, Remo, 11.30 a.m. Yeah, it's great. What do you mean? Are you going to have breakfast uh, with the Jets? Uh, well, you can I will. breakfast, right? 11.30 or does breakfast cut off at 11? Uh, well, it depends. Are we talking McDonald's, like fast food, or uh, just in general? It's it's the brunch hour. It's I definitely. Don't, I don't a know if the hour. grill. I don't know if the grill works after eleven. We'll have to find out. <laughs> no doubt about it. Um, all right. Well, it's three o'clock. Let's uh, let's do some marbles to finish this uh, this off. Schickster, exactly. Yeah. Jets brunch. I know some great great comments in here on uh, on the curling. Holman has the heel game face, and it's off-putting. Yeah, it's, hey, she's uh, she's the ice queen. She's locked in. Um, maybe not as warm and fuzzy as some of her other compatriots, but uh, I mean, this is uh, this is high-stakes sport. There's a lot on the uh, lot on the line, and I'm sure she had a, she had a big smile on her face after they won. That's Man, for sure. They put a, they had the party hats on uh, in the hotel room after. They did. They uh, were firing they had- it off crushing, emptying a few bottles of wine with the squad after they uh, finally got back on top of the Scotties. Let me see if I can find that picture. Yeah, they were they were ready to go for sure for that post-game part. Oh, here. And those hats that they were wearing that said rocks yeah. on them, actually made by a guy. Yeah, there's Rach. Yeah, she's, uh, she was enjoying it, that's for sure. That rocks hat is made by some guys that are big curling people and trying to build rinks down in Texas, I think of all places, Olympic sport, international sport. It's growing. We just happen to be in the hotbed of it right here in Manitoba with so many incredible curlers representing our province, both on the women's side and the men's side of it. Yeah. Hopefully they can have some success uh, at the world's, but we are tuned into the men now with the Montana's Briar. <laughs> Montana's shout out to Montana's for supplying, supporting curling. Mm-hmm. I don't know what happened to Tim Hortons, but uh, don't know what. It, yeah, shout out to the Scotties too. I got a lot of Scotties uh, Kleenex here too. Uh, Costco yeah. pack. That's I've a good been telling one. you, you got to teach Evan about curling. Get those uh, toilet mm-hmm. rolls out and do it like they do it on the ad. Show uh, how the how the kids work, uh, making it happen. All right, let's do this. Marbles time on WST. Okay. Um, let's get Tristan Rivers and then you can uh, fire it up. But uh, sure, let's give us a good one today. Random spin of the Tristan Rivers marbles theme wheel today. Oh man, on uh, on WST. Oh sure, I'll do this one here. Ready? Yep. It's Friday. The Pantera version of the Marbles theme. Um, all right, how many we got today? Yeah, well, Pantera was just here. I think it was last Friday. So I had to, I had to throw that one on. I missed the opportunity. And were you at Ice Cube earlier you know this what? week, Cus? I wasn't. I wasn't. It was right smack dab in the middle of those games. And uh, it was an off night for me. Uh, I did have a bunch of friends in there. Interested was Bruce. I'm sure Isha Boy Bruce was there. Anybody else take in the Ice Cube show? I had a lot of friends there. My Instagram feed was just full of uh, Ice Cube <laughs> stories. Everybody seemed to be there. It would be great. And you know what? While you get this ready, 
check this event out that's coming to Winnipeg. This was just announced this morning. And it is happening at the ballpark on Saturday, January, uh, sorry, Saturday, July 27th. This is going to be one of the great events of the summer. The Tacos and Tequila Festival featuring tacos, tequila, and throwbacks. I'll just read this up. Step back into the vibrant era of 90s and 2000s hip hop as Winnipeg gears up for Tacos and Tequila Festival presented by the Winnipeg Gold Eyes and Social House Entertainment. This throwback hip hop festival has enjoyed success in Kansas City, Dallas, Fort Worth, Milwaukee, Sioux Falls, and now it's Winnipeg's turn to witness the inaugural event on Saturday, July 27th at Blue Cross Park. This exhilarating event will showcase live performances from world renowned hip hop artists such as, okay, get this, Little John, Chingy, Chamillionaire, the Ying Yang Twins, Paul Wall, Mike Jones, DJ Ashton Martin, and more to be announced. The, uh, it is an 18 and up event. And you'll enjoy live performances from hip hop legends, the area's best taco chefs, handcrafted margaritas, a tequila testing tasting lounge, Lucha Libra wrestling. Wait, what? <laughs> Lucha Libra wrestling, a Chihuahua beauty pageant, a salsa and queso competition, art installations, photo ops, and more. This event is going from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. at the ballpark, Blue Cross Park. Tickets are going on sale today at Tacos and Tequila Winnipeg.com. And I guess this social house entertainment, say a group out of KC that has been started it there, putting on some other spots. So it's coming here. Count me in on that. We're going to have to get in touch. Maybe we can do a little promo for them and get some tickets for some WSTers. But honestly, Reem, you know, you hear a bunch of these summer events and, oh, that sounds pretty cool. I am so in on this. Wow. Yes, we need more of the – I've seen a couple of these throwback festivals. I know there's a massive one in Vegas. And, yes, it's Lil John. Pass Lil John. People are getting on you for your pronunciation. Lil, <laughs> pronunci sorry. That's right. Lil, I remember Lil, you correcting me back in the old days, uh, the old uh, 1290 days as well. Actually, yeah. it's Lil John. Lil, Lil John. And, um, yeah, and if you don't like uh, tacos, and there's also Neil Young, too, got announced at Blue Cross Park. Shout out to Yin Vivian, uh, July oh, Neil 6th. Neil Young's coming there? I, this is probably sacrilegious to a lot of people uh, yeah. listening. Um, obviously, Neil Young's a legend. I'm ten times more excited for the Tacos and Tequila Festival <laughs> with the Lucha Libra and everything than the Neil Young show, to be perfectly honest. I mean, is Neil Young going to have Lucha Libre wrestling at it? I don't, I don't think so, Huss. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so I think awesome. More, more outdoor events. I see a lot of these in states, like, fe like music festivals becoming a big thing. But you got to have more, and I think this is what that is. And cool that one of these is here with great artists like Lil Jon and Chameleonaire and DJ Paul Wall. It's uh, pretty awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I and also tacos. <laughs> we love tacos. Well, for sure. And I'll tell you what. I think I had about a lifetime's worth of margaritas when I was down in uh, down in Mexico. Uh, but handcrafted margaritas, right there. And you know what? Just the just the opportunity to see Chingy sing right there uh, at the ballpark is going to be. Uh, it could be a moment that we will uh, we will never forget. Uh, so anyway, Tacos and Tequila Festival, Winnipeg. Check it out. And uh, stay tuned. Maybe we'll be able to make something happen for WST because uh, we're definitely going to be there. We'd love to be uh, love to be a part of it. Um, all right, let's let's uh, let's do some marbles and get this weekend officially underway so I can go crack a little brown jug. Yeah, let me uh, just get these names settled in here. We got a lot of names in us. 250 names. Oh, baby. By the way, just as a reminder, gang, we do have a WST hoodie for our winner, but you do have to be subscribed to the channel. So if you have not already, hit that subscribe button on YouTube. It's completely free. Helps us grow the channel. And, uh, and please, if you haven't already, if you're with us right now, hit that thumbs up as well for today's episode. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, I'll also say subscribe to our newsletter too. It is in the um, it's in the comment section or sorry, it's in the description or at WinnipegSportsTalk.com if you're listening to the podcast. We do send out a weekly, you know, a weekly thing saying, hey, this is what you may have missed if you don't tune in every day. I know a bunch of people at the event yesterday saying they do appreciate you yeah. giving the heads up. So like this week, if you missed, I don't know, Alex Campbell from the Winnipeg Sea Bears. That was a great conversation. He was awesome. He was, uh, yeah, we're pumped for Sea Bears. You and Marat just, you know, a lot of, a lot of today about the Gary Bettman appearance. So there were some uh, great conversations that happened throughout the week. So make sure you're in on the mail list and we'll, you know, do give away stuff on there as well. So WinnipegSportsTalk.com. And scroll down to the bottom. Uh, there it is. Beautiful. Uh, Sarah Dolt, just subscribed. Thanks, Sarah. Great to have you here. I hope you're in on the marble race. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we will have some other opportunities for uh, moose tickets and AEW tickets. And if you missed it earlier this week, I know we've been all fired up for AEW coming in on uh, April 10th. It's been pushed back to the 1st of May. So your tickets, anyone that's won tickets already, they're still all good. Um, if you do need to, uh, if you bought tickets and you can't go that date, you've got a few days, I think, to uh, to refund them. But let's uh, fill that place for uh, for AEW coming up on uh, May first, and stay tuned to UWST for uh, some other options to uh, to win tickets. I uh, <laughs> lots of interesting uh, Matt Hyman Sage a millionaire again. Yeah, it's a millionaire. Just... Huh? millionaire. Yeah, well, you said Chad Miller. You said, okay, you said, that's why I was laughing. You said Chub Millionaire and Little John, and Spancy's <laughs> like, that sounds like my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you guys, I'm a professional broadcaster here. I'm just trying to read the words. We didn't get, you know, it's not like a hockey game. You don't have the pronunciation um, thing coming beside those guys. And I'll be honest, I did not know that uh, Chameleonaire was not Chameleonaire. Uh, because it does start with ch. Why wouldn't they just maybe have a k or a it's c? It's like chameleon, the like like the animal, but he's chameleon air. Interesting take. Interesting. You don't remember uh, what is the song? Riding. Big hit in <laughs> two thousand and six. No. <laughs> I oh. was just looking at the chingy at uh, the chingy um, discography, if mm-hmm. you will. Holiday Inn. From the Jackpot album in 2003, right there definitely was his uh, was probably his biggest hit. Uh, who, who could forget "Move, Bitch" from Word of Mouth, M O U F, or uh, "Damn Jeans," "Bala Baby," and "One Call Away." All, all those hits, chingy hits, I'm sure will be there for the Tacos and Tequila Festival. Uh, but man, that sounds great. Sounds a very unique event that we haven't seen before. And obviously, you add in a little Lucha Libra as well. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who's... People are saying Vampiro is part of this. It's the Masked Republic wrestling thing. So I don't know if Conan is involved in this, Hus. Or, oh, yes. Love Conan. Or Juventud Guerrera. He's still around. Hoovy. This is crazy. Someone said Vampiro, but I don't see evidence of, of Vampiro still. So. That, that you know what I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. Vampiro, um, actually from Thunder Bay. Really? If you didn't know that, yes. There's a little bit of wrestling trivia for you so tonight. I, Vampiro from Thunder Bay, Ontario. I had to go to the website, um, tacos and tequila Winnipeg dot com, <laughs> and uh, scroll down to experiences. Hundred different street tacos, handcrafted. Margaritas, Lucha Libre. There it Looks is. Looks sick. Looks thick. So they're bringing in the real deal Mast Republic. I might just go for the wrestling. And there's the Chihuahua. Beauty pageant. You got to submit. I got to get a dog. Get a dog. Salsa, Salsa queso. queso. Anyways, we'll find out more about this. Anyways, I know there's always some people that are freaking out. Come on, get on with the marbles. We will, we will. Uh, but as we have said no, before. This is, this is the best part. You do part. have the opportunity to check it later if you've got to run it's not going anywhere we will know however if you do win you need to send us an email to winnipegsportstalk.com so we can hook you up with the uh, with the thing so yeah hit the thumbs up subscribe if you haven't already we played the theme song remo let's fire it up and uh, let's do it yeah this is the best part of the show to me or the best part of the week us where we play the song 
and then screw around for like <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes talking about nonsense. And everyone's like, drop the marbles. And we're like, wait, I got to talk about uh, our favorite wrestling reference from 25 years ago. Well, hold on a second. That can wait. Was from. He grew up in Thunder Bay. Okay, yeah. anyways. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, <laughs> let's go. Okay. okay, so I picked actually picked a good track for this one. We have we do have two hundred and fifty marbles. In hey, the not thing. only do I have a mask, by the way, yes, you put that up. Yes, I got a Lucha Libra mask right here, ready to go. Like just in case I ever need to throw one on during the show for any if for any reason. We maybe have to wear that. All right. What's our track today? Beautiful uh, Chrissy one nine two nine one's beautiful powerful tunnel. Excellent. All right. Well, two fifty in the in the race today, everyone. Thank you for being with us. Been another great week. Make sure to join us next Friday. Double show. We'll get going probably at eleven a.m. Uh, we'll take you right through the trade deadline. So four hours. It's our third anniversary as well. So uh, we'll probably have maybe a few special contests to win, some festivities, maybe some food, maybe some LBJs, maybe a, a shot of Canadian club. Who knows? But next Friday, huge show, trade deadline day, and WST's third birthday. All right, we've gone on long enough. Good luck to everybody. New track, Marbles on WST. Let's kick off the weekend in style. Drop them, Reem. Here we go. I like these drop-ins. Ben Dover with a great, great early spot. Ben Dover on the right side. Larry Eloy looked like he had the inside track on the uh, left side of this one. And it is Ben Dover, our leader. Really nice start for Ben or Mr. <laughs> Dover. Um, Dover, and then, uh-oh, here comes the sheriff, Gregory Liverpool, although Gregory just got held up. Not sure what happened. Brody. All right, here we go. It's a nice, you get shot up into one of these two tubes. And we've got action on either side. Larry Eloy's on the right. Presley. Oh, Presley Tarowski. That I think is going to be an over the top rope. Yes, you got to watch out. Presley's done. Coach Mike, Amy Weeb as well. There's our guy, Bobby B. He made it through. Bobby B is actually the winner. Jay Miller just took a bullet right now. Oh, Amanda. Amanda's looking good. She's had a couple of rough weeks. This could be, uh, this could be the time when, uh, my friend Amanda gets right into the mix. She'll be ready to party tonight if she can ever win this marble race. It's been the elusive, elusive title that is missed. All right, Bobby B, Brody, Leslie Mitchnuck, all in the mix. All right, everyone is sort of stopped together. This is going to be, we'll see when it opens up, but there is a big, big group of marbles all coming in at the same time into this next very interesting the okay earl james elias mccracken chris fadoon chris has made it down first great track oh amanda's in first now all of a sudden could this be a friday marbles miracle so many close calls could this be it i think amanda is in first place right now Mike wins now there. A whole bunch of... All right, here we go. It is Amanda in first, Chris Fadoon in second. Going into this next tube, our leaders are one and two, neck and neck, either side. Now going into the next tube, who will it be? We are coming right down to it. Amanda and Chris. Amanda and Chris. Who will get in there first? Looks like Amanda's got a very slight lead. Could this be the day? She did it. She did it, everybody. Oh, my God. Going to be partying at Wind City and in the south side of the city today. Amanda has done it for the first time, won the marble race. Congratulations. 
Well, what a what a story, and what a great what a great great race. Uh, Amanda first, Chris Fadoon second, Mike Wynn, shout out section three sixteen, row one in third. Lauren Gradden, lock shopper, VR Montenegro. What's up, VR? Top five performance. That's amazing. Cigars for everyone. Kathy Crossan. Hi, Kathy. Seventh, Leslie Mitchnuck, Ryan Kivens, and B A Split as well. You know, I've given Amanda some heat for some poor performances as of late, and she steps <laughs> up and wins first place out of 250 marbles today. Oh, man. This is uh, <laughs> this a great race. An awesome track, Remo. That was, uh, that was something. I had to test a bunch until I found a, a suitable one. And Amanda writes, holy shit, three exclamation marks. It <laughs> happened with three exclamation marks. So shout out, shout out Amanda. Yeah. Uh, hey, another, another loyal WS tier and Marvel's contestant finally gets her day in the sun. Very happy for you, my dear. Um, good stuff, man. Uh, great track. Great finish to the show. And uh, let's hope maybe the good vibes from Amanda's win can get on to the hockey club tomorrow with that early start against the Canes. Uh, and then right back at it against Buffalo. And I will say this, Reem, when I was looking at the schedule, even with the wins, this was a little trip that did sort of make me nervous. We knew the Jets had had trouble with Dallas earlier in the year. Although I was quite looking forward to seeing whether if they could get the better of them. That didn't happen last night. Uh, but I think we all have memories of uh, some not so fun road game watching experiences against Carolina and Buffalo for that matter. Um, so hopefully much like a lot of this season has been different this year. Hopefully they can change that and uh, come back with some points to show for this road trip. Yeah. You're bringing back some bad memories of the benching last year or Patrick line getting blown up. I think it was Jake McCabe. That year, so uh, way to go, Huss, bringing up some some tough losses. But yeah, back to back. Then here on Tuesday, then the trade deadline. We're gonna have a lot to talk about. So uh, make sure you're subscribed uh, here, and we'll have a, a busy Jets weekend review. A four gamer, oh yeah, Connor coming up Monday on our podcast feed and um, our YouTube channel as well. So I mean, make sure you're on both. Uh, don't just uh, don't just do yeah, one. Yeah, I guess we didn't. I guess Connor didn't jump on the show this week. Um, He'll be he next certainly week. will next week. He's going to jump yeah. on. Rooms is going to be away for a bit on on Wednesday, so hopefully he can do. And then all hands on deck for uh, our birthday party and the trade deadline extravaganza coming up on Friday. Uh, I believe we'll probably get going at eleven in the morning uh, and take it to three or whenever the dust settles on uh, on the deadline. But uh, that's going to do it for us today. Thanks to Weber, Brandon Rewicki, Teddy Drip himself, Ted Wyman, and uh, all of you. Congratulations, Amanda, on your big victory. It's been a long time coming. And uh, shout out to everyone uh, who joined us last night for our event for the Winnipeg Whiskey Festival. And a big thanks again to our great partners at Canadian Club for uh, putting all that together. And shout out to Lucas for those incredible boxes. We're still talking about that. Um, that's going to do it for us. Enjoy the games this weekend, gang. Again, 11.30 a.m. tomorrow, 6 p.m. on Sunday. Jets this week with Connor Ravchak will be in your inbox when you get up on Monday morning. Or you can check it out on YouTube. And then join us at 1 o'clock to recap the weekend and look ahead to uh, two games against the Kraken and, of course, NHL trade deadline week in the league. That's going to do it for us. For Michael Remus, I'm Huss. Have a great weekend. We will see you Monday at 1 p.m. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down. Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.